today I've put together an, um, a program um, that uh, is more or less f um, focused on the basics of um, nonlinear optics comb generation supercontinuum. So for those um, who have already quite a, a strong background in nonlinear optics, I may have to apologize. For those who don't, um, please consider it just uh, as a kind of as a refresher of uh, of basic nonlinear optical processes. And so the um, um, the first part of the tutorial is really um, um, I'd like to talk about just some very basics about optical frequency combs. Um, so what frequency combs are, what they're useful for, and how they can be generated using femtosecond lasers. And in the um, second part, I'll talk um, about a, a new type of optical frequency combs over the last five, ten years has really been taking off, um, which is to utilize the kernel linearity to generate optical combs. And I'll tell you about um, uh, different ways different states of operation. I'll tell you about solitons and also in the course of doing so I'd like to give a brief introduction and history of solitons and um, then afterwards I'd like to tell you about some of the uh, salient kind of physics of these solitons uh, when it comes to their uh, behavior uh, in optical microresonators. In particular I'd like to talk about Raman solitons, you know, dark solitons and then also tell you about applications of microresonator frequency combs uh, in this first part. Now the second part will be shorter on uh, the second part, a lot of the material we'll be using actually um, um, uh, uh, is very similar to a microresonator comb, so I'll be uh, more brief on that one. But I'd like to give a basic introduction into supercontinuum generation, in particular in light um, of recent advances of using integrated photonics. And so, um, so what are optical frequency combs? So optical combs, um, optical frequency combs um, are phase coherent links that link an optical frequency um, to a microwave frequency. And so just mathematically, you can think about a comb um, as uh, um, linking here new N, an optical frequency here, to, a, to two radio frequencies. And we'll talk about what the physical uh, ramifications are. One is the so-called offset frequency, and one is the repetition rate. And so the repetition rate here, um, uh, if this is an optical frequency, and if this is an RF frequency in the radio frequency domain, that integer number here uh, is very large. So you can think about a comb as a gearbox from the optical domain to the RF domain. And, um, and so you can run an optical frequency comb uh, in, in, in two directions, in two ways. The first of all, the question is how can you generate such an optical spectrum? Um, so a spectrum of equidistant laser line is inherently generated by a mode lock laser. So any pulse laser source okay, that has a certain you know, pulse repetition rate will give you in Fourier domain an optical comb. And so then the repetition rate is nothing else than the round trip time of light. Uh, and by the way, if there's any questions, since it's a small room, um, please do not hesitate to ask yeah, in case something is unclear. Um, and so this carrier envelope frequency uh, FCO I'll get to um, is a so-called offset frequency that's inherent to uh, also the, to any femtosecond laser. I'll describe what the physical you know, background of that is. And you can run, so if you have such a phase current comb, so, um, that is to say if you know the carrier envelope frequency and the repetition rate, what you can do is you can run a frequency comb in two directions. One is um, you can synthesize frequencies. So imagine you were able to fix the carrier envelope frequency and the repetition rate. You can synthesize an optical frequency. Okay? And that's called frequency synthesis. So in this case, you, you transfer the stability of your um, FCO and your repetition rate to the optical domain. Um, in the other uh, direction, you can also run it as a frequency divider. Okay? In this case, what you do is um, imagine you have a very stable optical frequency. This could, for instance, be a frequency that's generated by an, an ion, okay, a stable atomic reference, then um, what you can do is um, if you fix the carrier envelope frequency and you know um, that comb teeth n, what you have is a phase current link, but now from the optical main to the RF. That is to say that the, the, the RF frequency inherits all the phase noise properties of the um, original uh, optical carrier. And that's called optical frequency division. And so for, um, um, for many decades, it has been extremely challenging to create a link between the optical domain and the radio frequency domain. And, uh, and some of the very first phase coherent links from the optical to the RF domain was um, operated at the PTB in Braunschweig in Germany. And this was an experiment where literally uh, one started in the microwave domain and where um, microwave frequencies were multiplied up to a terahertz, were multiplied up to the mid-IR and multiplied up to the optical domain. And so these were rooms kind of, of uh, filled with, uh, with equipment to do this multiplication and to create this phase coherent RF to optical link. Now, uh, what happened um, uh, in, um, over the last uh, yeah, 20 years is that there has been a really revolutionary way to measure optical frequencies that make these frequency chains completely obsolete. 
And, uh, and that has to do with the advent of optical frequency combs and their realization. And um, how do you generate an optical frequency combs? As alluded to, if you have a pulsed you know, uh, source, you have, um, uh, then um, the pulses are emitted with a time delay, the, rep the repetition time or the repetition rate. And so in full domain, that's just the comb spacing. And in addition, if you have some dispersion in your laser cavity, the pulse envelope and the pulse carrier travel at different speeds. So group and phase velocity need not be the same. And that implies that not every pulse that is emitted from the laser okay, is identical. And if, for instance, every tenth pulse is identical, that means that your care envelope frequency is the repetition rate divided by 10. And the care envelope frequency will show up as, the, as an offset to the entire comb. Okay, so it's to an FCO that is here near DC. So if you can measure that FCO frequency, you can stabilize the, the entire optical comb. So this is, was an exceedingly, yeah, exceedingly simple kind of idea. Um, all you need to know is kind of Fourier analysis. Um, and that idea happened and originated not very far from here. Um, in fact, from Stanford University in 1978 uh, uh, yeah, by Ted Hensch, who at the time with Eckstein had the idea of using mode lock lasers to make precision measurements of frequencies. Because if you have an optical comb, you know the cam lock frequency, you know the mode spacing, and you have an unknown frequency you want to measure, all you need to do is heterodyne the unknown frequency with one of the comb teeth. And you have a very precise way of measuring frequencies, optical frequencies that oscillates with hundreds of terahertz per second. So, um, um, so why does this uh, simple idea take so long? Um, well, um, it took so long because uh, it's very challenging to measure that carrier envelope frequency, that FCO frequency. And the uh, method that uh, Ted Henge and Jen Hall devised to measure carrier envelope frequency is uh, the following. You take the red portion of the spectrum, okay, that has here n times omega rep plus uh, FCO, you double it and you superimpose it with the blue side. And if you do that, actually you measure, okay, the, uh, the, you get out actually from this doubling, this interference, you get the, uh, the FCO, okay? Now, um, this seems like a very simple idea, and it's kind of very simple mass. All you need to do is multiply the red end by two, okay, superimpose with the blue end, you'll see it, you get out the care envelope frequency. Um, but what makes it so challenging? And what makes it so challenging is that you need a spectrum that is a factor of two in frequency. And uh, you need that spectrum to be fully coherent. And um, if you think about kind of pulse durations, if you have a femtosecond laser, say, uh, with that sends and gets, gives you 25 femtosecond pulses, that's a 3 dB bandwidth of in, in 1550 of about 20 terahertz, so very far away from a full octave. So the question is, how can you generate really coherent octave spanning spectra? And, um, and that is something that uh, was only developed much later. Uh, in the late 90s and uh, went back to two developments, one in Bell Labs and one development uh, in Bath in UK by Philip Russell. Um, and it had to do with the advent of so-called photonic crystal fibers or rainbow fibers. And what makes these uh, fibers special is that these fibers can have a zero dispersion wavelength, a crossing of the zero dispersion in the visible, opposite to conventional, um, non conventional optical fiber. And this leads to a process that we'll visit in the second part of this lecture, and which is supercontinuum generation. And supercontinuum generation is an incredibly useful process. What it allows to do is, is take an initial pulse that you send into a PCF and broaden it coherently to a, to a full spectrum, uh, to a full octave. Um, and um, what is striking is that this process okay, um, is fully coherent under certain circumstances. And I'll explain actually what the circumstances are, but I'll let me mention it has to do with the so-called soliton number you're operating at. Okay? So you can convert your pulse energy okay, um, into, um, uh, with knowledge of dispersion into a so-called soliton number, and that needs to be very low in order for the process to appear coherent. Otherwise, you'll have an incoherent broadening. So with that process, you can measure then um, the beating of the uh, two ends, and thereby um, obtain the so-called envelope frequency beat, and uh, obtain a phase coherent link from the RF to the optical domain. And that was achieved um, uh, for the first time uh, um, at NIST, uh, in his Jones paper in 2000. Um, so let me just mention the references are far from complete, but what I've tried to do is kind of place uh, the most important publications uh, for the respective topics actually on the, on the bottom of each slide. Um, and so th this paper by Jones uh, at NIST demonstrated for the first time um, that you can make that phase current link from the RF to optical and measure the carrier envelope frequency okay, with, with uh, sufficiently good precision to achieve a faithful uh, um, link from optical frequencies to radio frequencies. And so this has allowed really a revolution in, uh, in many applications. Um, and the first application of an RF to optical link 
uh, lies in the realization of optical atomic clocks. Because if you um, can link an optical frequency to an RF frequency, what you can do is you can link one optical comb teeth to a very stable reference, like in the first example was an iron trap by the group of, of Dave Vineland in aluminum, and, and take that optical frequency, divide it down to the RF domain, and make clocks that are vastly more stable than clocks that are based on cesium, okay, which use microwave traditions. And the enhanced uh, um, accuracy of the clocks in this case comes simply from the fact that the transition in the optical domain have a higher Q. So if you ask what is the ratio of the carry transition of a transition divided by the lifetime, okay, by decay rate, that is vastly better, say, for an aluminum clock, okay, the, um, uh, or modern clocks now use uh, typically uh, uh, laser-cooled atoms, typically laser lattice clocks with for dipole forbidden transitions that have really literally uh, coherence times of, of many tens of seconds. Other applications of combs, and uh, those were actually, um, uh, um, yeah, only discovered really later and, um, um, and go beyond just frequency metrology. You can use also combs to make and synthesize very low noise microwaves. Um, you can also use them for astrophysical spectrometer calibration. I'll talk about that. Uh, ranging, LIDAR, uh, optical arbitrary waveform generation. And in fact, any application where you need to either synthesize frequencies with high precision or measure frequencies with high precision. They all benefit actually from, from the optical comb technique. So uh, combs are commercial. Um, uh, so combs um, have been commercialized uh, now by several companies. Uh, several also be here at Clio. This is Imra, uh, Toptica, and uh, kind of the, uh, yeah, the original leader in the field, which is Menlo Systems, a spin-off from the lab of Ted Hench. And this is just an example of one of the original kind of uh, Thai sapphire combs. And the conventional systems now that are commercial, these are fiber-based and uh, typically shoebox-sized and use erbium femtosecond lasers together with HNLF fibers, so high nonlinear fiber for the, for the broadening stages. So what happened over the um, last uh, 10 years, however, is that, in, um, is that um, yeah, the research field developed around another topic, which is not generating combs with um, uh, femtosecond lasers based on uh, that use utilized mode locking, but using microresonators. And, um, and microresonators are devices that um, store light for extended amounts of time in small volume. And um, they go back already many decades to work um, of Vladimir Braginsky in the, in, the, in the 80s and 90s uh, on high-Q microwave cavities that were later then realized also in the optical domain using uh, so-called whispering Gaussian modes. And um, what was observed um, uh, in 2007 is that you can also generate an optical comb by uh, sending a CW laser into an optical resonator and using the so-called parametric Fourier mixing. And so I'll spend a little bit of time actually in explaining the background actually of that, of that process. So uh, let me, before doing so, um, give a, a very short introduction into microresonators them, micro themselves. So in particular in their, you know, their properties and their, their description. And so um, this will be very basic, but um, let me still um, go through. So microresonators, um, again, are just devices that can find light for extended amounts of time in small volumes. And they um, can uh, be realized in, in a vast variety of materials and platforms. And they all kind of share the common kind of uh, uh, principle that you utilize the total internal reflection okay, at the uh, cavity perimeters to confine light. And, uh, and materials that um, uh, these days uh, are, you know, can, be, can be processed using you know, etching techniques include everything from aluminum nitride to diamond, silica, algas. Uh, and I'll say something about the respective role of nonlinearity. Um, um, one thing I can already point out is that in general, um, uh, what you like to do in any kind of um, uh, st any study where you like to harness the nonlinearity of the material is you like to stay away from the so-called two photon transition. So if you work at 15, 50 nanometer, okay, then your photon energy is about 0.7 eV. So um, you like to have a band gap that at least is 1.5, 5-ish kind of electron volts to stay away from two photon absorption. And, uh, and that's actually the reason why in this list here of materials for uh, CARICOM generation, um, you'll see one very prominent material absent, and that's silicon. So even though silicon is being ubiquitously used in silicon photonics, it's actually uh, quite difficult to utilize it for parametric frequency conversion on grounds that the band gap actually is too small. Um, um, and algas here in this list is probably kind of right on the edge because they're in algas. The band gap is, is right at the, at the, at the two-four trans transition edge. Now, in all these uh, uh, structures, you can generate, uh, as I'll describe, uh, care frequency combs. Um, but before doing so, I'd like to just give um, some very basic kind of um, uh, introduction into um, the description of microresonators. Because uh, irrespective of 
uh, which fields you're following, you typically are faced um, uh, with, with equations that describe, okay, the coupling of modes in time, so the so-called, so yeah, temporal mode uh, equation or, or coupled mode equations. And so, um, so let's think uh, briefly about um, and introduce a few notions. So if you have a microresonator, okay, and you have a bus waveguide, this bus waveguide uh, serves two roles. One is to feed energy into the system and also to collect light from the, from the resonator. And the easiest way to describe um, uh, kind of this system is not necessarily using a matrix model, but using kind of what Hermann House introduced um, uh, in, a, in a very beautiful, uh, in this very illustrative book here, Fields and Wave, is coupling of modes in time. And so A here um, is the resonator amplitude, okay? Um, uh, and uh, the omega naught is the eigenfrequency of one of the re cavity resonances, okay? And you, of course there are many. Um, and then you have two decay rates, um, one over um, tau t naught, this is the intrinsic decay rate, and one is, uh, the second one here is the external decay rate. And so the external decay rate actually is not really a decay rate, it just tells you actually with what rate photons leak back into the waveguide, okay? Um, and um, now, um, these equations are normalized in such a way that A squared, you know, denotes energy inside the resonator, okay? Um, in, it, in contrast, um, S squared here, the magnitude of S squared, that's the power that you launch, okay? And so, because S squared is power and A squared is energy, okay, the two units are not the same. And for that reason, there's this little kind of not intuitive factor of one over square root of tau external in front of, of S, okay? So that's actually just the to get the right units and uh, so to convert a flux into a uh, corresponding square root of energy inside the cavity. So when you have these equations and when you understand these, then um, a lot of physics already immediately follow, follows. Um, uh, uh, a few other um, uh, um, yeah, points here. Um, often it's also useful to introduce the quality factor, which is just omega naught tau. Um, and um, um, what we also should, um, if you wonder about this factor of two in these equations here, um, they have a physical meaning because the field decays twice as slow as energy. So the one over tau naught here, that's the photon decay rate. And the photon decay rate is defined with respect to energy. And for this reason, actually, there's this factor of two in the field equations. So actually, you need to use that, otherwise um, you get um, inc incorrect, incorrect results, depending on, on what you like to, like to calculate. Now, um, one important um, metric is how efficient is the input coupling into a resonator? Okay, and, and here you can compute the so-called transmission coefficient, T, and the transmission coefficient is nothing else than the input field divided by the output field in the square magnitude. Okay, and inside the resonator you can distinguish uh, three different regimes. Okay, um, one regime is called undercoupling, and undercoupling is a regime where um, the photon decay rate in the waveguide here is much smaller than the intrinsic loss rate. Okay, and in that case um, the transmission is, will be very, very close to unity, Okay, um, and we call that undercoupled. In contrast, you can also be overcoupled, and overcoupled actually implies that your um, coupling rate, okay, into the resonator is much larger than the um, than the corresponding decay rate, okay, or equivalently stated, your you know f your uh, external coupling time is much shorter than your uh, it's much uh, shorter than your uh, um, uh, cavity loss time tau naught. In that case, you talk of, uh, that you're overcoupled, and overcoupling implies actually that the power actually that gets transmitted past the resonator, okay, has in fact passed through the cavity itself, okay. Even though the transmission can stay very close to unity, still all the power actually will have interacted with the resonator. And right in between these regimes, there is the so-called critical coupling point, where the coupling into the resonator and output coupling exactly balance each other, and that's um, equivalent to electrical impedance matching. And so in that case, what happens here is an interference phenomena. You have light, okay, that travels past the resonator. You have light that builds up in the cavity, and the cavity light that exits from that cavity interferes destructively. Okay, so it's an destructive interference that gives you then the critical coupling condition. And this condition here is the condition where you have most of the power inside the resonator. Okay, um, so all the power is dissipated inside the cavity. Now what happens to the power? Well, it's just lost due to intrinsic absorption, right? So that's, the power is just converted into, into heat. So, um, um, so this is graphically. Um, so again, you have the transmission coefficient, you have the optical line width, um, you go from undercoupled to critical coupled to overcoupled, okay? And so the critical coupling point here is a point of uh, maximum extinction, and that's where you transfer all the power into, into the resonator. Now, um, even though um, this, this, this kind of picture here uh, and these coupled mode equations, uh, they look very simple, um, uh, 
the actual physical reality is a little more complicated. And the reason it's more complicated is, is that often the resonator bus waveguides and uh, the microresonators, they're multi-mode. They're not single mode. And what is it, what's the consequence of this? The consequence is the following. You might send in one optical mode, okay, in, um, in launch it through the waveguide. That optical mode will couple okay, into the cavity. But that cavity mode itself can, in principle, couple back not just to the mode that you launched, but also to higher order modes. It may be slightly phase mismatched, but it doesn't prevent it from still leaking out into many kind of waveguide modes. And, uh, and this leads to a problem um, that's called ideality. So that is to say that if you have multiple modes that you in, inside your bus waveguide, uh, so your bus waveguide is multi-mode, you actually lose power okay, um, uh, um, in the, by virtue of coupling to higher order modes. And, uh, and um, in order to prevent that coupling, that output coupling, that coupling loss to occur, what you need to do is design okay, your photonic resonator and photonic waveguide in such a way that the buff bus waveguide only phase matches very well one, from the one mode family. The mode, in fact, um, for instance, if you have a point-like coupler, point-like coupler is actually implied that you have a large phase matching bandwidth. It implies actually that the cavity mode can decay automatically into multi-modes or many modes of the, of the waveguide itself. Um, and um, to give you an example of this behavior, um, let me show you um, first uh, an example on the, on the upper side here. This is a, a microresonator, for instance, coupled to a straight bus waveguide. Okay, that's multi-mode. The lower one is a microresonator coupled to a single-mode waveguide. Um, in the case of the single-mode waveguide, you see nicely you go undercoupled, critical coupled, overcoupled. You follow the ideal theory. In contrast, in the first case here, where you have a multi-mode waveguide coupled to a multi-mode resonator, you see no coupling curve at all. Okay, so in fact, what's varied here is the distance of the bus waveguide to the resonator. You don't see any resonances. And the striking aspect here is that this as the absence of resonances has nothing to do with the resonator itself. It's not a property that etching is bad, or etc. It's actually purely due to the fact that you have here a so-called parasitic loss from higher order modes. So, um, so even though these matrix models look you know, um, deceptively simple, Okay, the phase matching uh, is absolutely critical to also obtain high quality factors in, in optical microresonators. So um, a few other properties of microresonators. Um, uh, so in addition to the line width um, of the resonator, every resonator will also have naturally occurring you know, resonances and a mode progression. And uh, this mode progression um, is typically expressed as a series of um, resonances that is expanded in the mode number mu. So, um, so what we're looking here is the following situation. Let's fix one of our modes of interest here as being our principal mode, and we label that with an index mu equal to zero. Okay, um, so that is so mu equals zero is just omega naught, and um, and what you can do now is you can expand okay uh, the frequencies around that central mode in a Taylor series. So if you had a perfectly equidistant grid of frequencies, okay. Um, the first term in a Taylor, si Taylor series would be the so-called D1 coefficient. So D1 is nothing else than separation of adjacent resonances. And we give that a name, we call it the free spectral range. Now, um, the free spectral range in general will vary. And um, if you have anomalous group velocity dispersion, the free spectral range will increase with frequency. If you have normal group velocity dispersion, actually it will decrease. And that means in this language here that an anomalous GVD Okay, where the free spectral range increases with frequency corresponds to a D2 coefficient that's larger than, than zero, whereas normal GVD corresponds to a D2 that's smaller than zero. Um, what we can also do is we can define, and we'll, we'll see actually why that becomes kind of useful, we can also define what's called um, an integrated dispersion. And by integrated dispersion, okay, what we mean is the following. If you have a perfect equidistant grid of frequencies, no matter where you are, okay, the deviation from the equidistant grid is zero. Okay, in contrast, if you have anomalous GVD, the deviation from an equidistant grid will increase quadratically as I move away from my, my uh, point of origin. And so what you've done here is you've taken the original mode progression, you subtract an equidistant grid, and, and that's called the integrated dispersion. And this integrated dispersion actually will have a very useful meaning for the following reason. Because if you have a, a microresonator and you ask yourself, can a nonlinear process extend okay, out to a certain frequency band, what you can do is you can look at the integrated dispersion, okay, and ask yourself, is the 
care frequency shift sufficiently large to overcome that dispersion barrier. So it's a useful kind of metric to describe nonlinear processes. And we also see that zero crossings of the integrated dispersion will give actually rise to dispersive waves, too, in, in particular in the, in the context of, um, of um, yeah, salt and strength of radiation. So, um, so putting it together, what we have is um, if you have an equidistant resonator, um, you would have just an equidistant grid of modes. If you have second order dispersion, you have this parabolic variation. And what you can also do is, and just for completeness, I've linked these coefficients d2, which is the group loss dispersion coefficient, d1, which is the free spectral range. I've um, also pointed out that you can express them as the so-called beta 2 coefficient and a d coefficient that you typically have in fiber optics. So in fiber optics, you typically would be kind of used to this beta 2 coefficient, which is the expansion of your, of your, of your wave vector, which is, the, which is your GVD coefficient. And you can relate that simply to the, um, uh, also to this D2 coefficient. And one thing to note here um, is that beta 2 and D2 actually have opposite sign. Okay, so in fiber optics, a negative dispersion is NML GVD. Uh, D2 actually, when it's positive, is NMLs in the case of a resonator. So these are just things one has to always be a little cautious with um, because conventions change depending on um, what parameter is calculated. So how do you measure dispersion? Um, um, so one, if you have an optical microresonator, for instance, um, it could also be a cavity of any sorts, and you would like to make a very precise measurement of dispersion. Um, then, uh, less surprisingly, uh, also optical combs can be, can be a very useful tool. And, um, and the way you can uh, measure uh, dispersion of, a, of, a, of, of any kind of device um, is the following. You have your device under test. You use a femtosecond laser frequency comb as a reference. And so it's a fully phase stabilized comb. And what you do is you uh, take an ECDL, an external cavity diode laser. And these are lasers that can scan extremely far. So the, um, uh, uh, there's even units that scan from 1250 all the way to 600 nanometer, um, continuously more top free, and uh, can do that very fast. So typically in just a, you know, a few tens of milliseconds. And so how can you calibrate on the fly the frequency? What you do is you record the beating of the scanning laser with an optical comb. And, what you, and so what you will see is you will see heterodyne beat nodes that move in frequency as the comb teeth, okay, as the laser is approaching the comb teeth. Once it jumps beyond it, okay, then the frequency will increase again. And now what you do is you just place RF filters around okay, each comb teeth. Um, so you take the photodetectric signal, you place bandpass filters, and these give you markers. And it will give you, you always get for every uh, comb teeth two markers, one um, which is Whatever, which is below the filter frequency, one which is above the fr uh, filter frequency compared to the um, um, comb teeth. And uh, this is an example of such a spectrum. So you see here the, 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 the filter frequencies on an, uh, on an oscilloscope, and you see in green here the optical resonance of the cavity. And, um, and so now by just interpolating between the points, you can make a very precise calibration. Um, precise meaning here, typically um, you have an accuracy of 100 nanometer in a scan time of uh, typically 100 millisecond of something like uh, 10 to 100 kilohertz. So these are fairly precise, sufficiently precise to measure the influence of dispersion. Um, so the advantage of this technique also is there's, there's no locks required. You just scan uh, the, the free running laser over the, over the comb. Now, uh, this is an example um, of, uh, uh, of a microresonator, a crystalline microresonator made from magnesium fluoride. And, um, and the mu here is the mode number. And these are 200 modes that are recorded. And what you see here is that these modes follow very nicely a parabola. And the way of they are drawn here is not obviously as absolute frequency, but what's drawn here is again only the residuals, okay, here, this part. So only the quadratic contribution and the cubic contribution, which is negligible here, which is called the integrated dispersion. And we can see, for instance, here that over 200 modes of this 14 gigahertz repetition rate, our integrated dispersion, okay, is about, in this case, 100, 100 megahertz. So that's integrated dispersion that we accumulate, okay, as we as the, as the modes uh, kind of vary. What you can also see here is that there's mode crossings, and these come from the fact that the resonator itself actually, um, of course, is not single mode, it's multi-mode, and any imperfections will start coupling modes. Now, if you um, look at other more complicated um, uh, structures, such as not um, kind of these, um, or, or not complicated, but rather if you look at a larger bandwidth, this is an example of a silicon nitride microresonator. What you see here is that there's not just a quadratic contribution of dispersion, but you start to also see now the cubic contribution. And uh, I'll explain actually a moment where these contributions come from. 
um, there's contributions from the materialist version, but also from the waveguide contribution. And uh, in this case here, what you can see is that, okay, uh, there's a region where D2 is positive, which is anomalous GVD, and then there's a region where D2 is negative, okay, which is normal GVD. So now, where does a dispersion come from? What are the kind of the, the origins? Um, um, first of all, uh, materials typically tend to have absorption in the ultraviolet. So, um, so no matter which material you take, okay, you typically have a band gap and you run to absorption. That's typically the case for the, for the UV. So take, take a semiconductor, aluminum nitride, has a band gap of 5 UV, fibers about 5 UV, uh, silicon nitride as well. And so that means that as you go to the visible, okay, the refractive index actually, in this case, or the GVD, uh, starts to become very strongly normal. And why is that? Simply because of the curvature of the refractive index. Okay, so the GVD is just a second derivative of, of, of lambda. Um, typically, as you go to a longer wavelength, um, there's less variation, okay, and, uh, and materials can also naturally exhibit an anomalous group velocity dispersion. So that's one contribution. Um, the second contribution that's going to be particularly important um, uh, in the context of integrated photonics is the contribution of the geometry itself. Okay, so let's take a look at a, a very simple example. Let's take a look at a waveguide with a certain width and a certain height. And, um, and what you will see is that any waveguide okay, um, that's rectangular in shape will always have the same um, dependence okay, and characteristics with respect to its uh, geometry dependent uh, dispersion. If you take a look, for instance, at short wavelengths, okay, what you will see is that most of the, um, uh, most of the materials, kind of, most of the, the light will be confined well inside the material itself. Okay? So the effective index in this case, okay, will be very close to the effective index of the, of the material itself. Now, in contrast, if you go to long wavelengths, most of the light actually will start to be evanescent. Okay? So, in fact, what it means is that now your, effect, your effective refractive index will approach that of the cladding. And in between, there's a sigmoid function. And you will have that for any type of material. Okay? And that, now, if you look at a sigmoid here, you have a derivative of refractive index n Okay, that's in this case negative, one that's positive here, the second order derivative. And that means that, that in the case of a tightly confined um, light, so this part here, so this part here, what you have is uh, for the tight confinement, you have animal dispersion, whereas for the weak confinement, you have normal dispersion. Okay. And, um, and so any waveguide that very tightly confines light will in introduce a animal CBD. And that can compensate the normal dispersion that we heard before. And the reason that's very important is that for any parametric frequency conversion, you need to have anomalous GVD and anomalous group velocity dispersion. And so you need to operate in a regime where the waveguides okay, are very tightly confining the light. That is to say, where the, yeah, the wavelength okay, um, is such that most of, the refractive, most of the energy sits inside the cladding material where you have this um, um, negative curvature contribution of the effective index. Now, um, um, what's shown here is a plot for a waveguide made from silicon nitride. Um, and what you can see is that at 1550 nanometers, so, um, or actually this is, for two th this is for 230, so about one micron, you have animals GVD, so you have a positive D2 coefficient. But what you can also see is that um, at some point, actually, you run out of animals GVD, and you pick up a normal contribution which cancels the contribution again from the um, uh, from the animals GVD. So that's why we have these so-called zero crossings here, because we are, have already entered the normal dispersion regime. So you can see here we have here, okay, animals GVD, and then here in these regions we have normal GVD. Okay, and then we have the zero crossing exactly when normal dispersion is compensated the animals dispersion. So um, if you look at the spectra, um, and we'll I'll explain that actually in the in particular in the case of of care frequency combs, is this um, um, frequency offset that you have, okay, in the case of an optic microresonator, is um, a barrier that needs to be uh, crossed um, using the cell phase modulation. Okay, so um, if you have 20 gigahertz here of integrated dispersion, okay, and you ask yourself the question, can you generate an optical frequency comb that spans, okay, uh, all the way across this uh, dispersion <laughs> barrier, then your care frequency shift inside the resonator needs to be at least 20 gigahertz to compensate that. So it's a good kind of rule of thumb to find out, do you have a sufficient linearity to overcome the dispersion? And you can make the same calculation for a waveguide. In the case of waveguides, you wouldn't plot the int, but rather the wave factor mismatch, delta k. And then you can also ask yourself, do I have sufficient kind of nonlinear phase shift to compensate that wave factor mismatch? 
So that's why in the case um, of resonance, we express it typically in hertz because um, it's a frequency mismatch, whereas for waveguides, it will be a wave vector mismatch. Um, now, there's many ways to engineer dispersion. Um, and uh, I want to give okay, one example to show you the richness of integrated photonics. And um, one way to, to engineer dispersion is, for instance, to take coupled resonators. So if you have two resonators okay, that are coupled, you get bonding and antibonding mode, so symmetric and asymmetric modes. And, um, and if you then plot the dispersion, what you will see is that you can get, for one of the mode families, you get normal dispersion. For the other mode family, NMLS dispersion. Just by virtue of the fact that if you have uh, um, symmetric and asymmetric modes, okay, they hybridize, then again, you can exploit their effective, their effective index variation as a function of wavelength. And um, another example is shown here, where um, for a single core waveguide, you have a very large NMLS, you have an NMLS UVD window, you have this very large kind of um, dispersion barrier uh, to climb due to the fact that you have, you have uh, yeah, dispersion waveguide. If you now bring a second waveguide close, you can lower that barrier by mode hybridization. And um, I only want to, to kind of not go into too much detail, but what I want to leave you with is the notion that um, when you go to very complex integrated photonic structures, there is a lot of degrees of freedom that you have that you can play with in order to engineer the dispersion landscape. And that makes integrated photonics quite a fruitful playground. Um, and so very similar to photonic crystal fibers, you can engineer single core, multi core, uh, um, a kind of waveguides or even make slotted waveguides to kind of make typically very flat dispersions or dispersion landscape with multiple zero uh, NMLS GVD regions. So um, the process that I like to, yeah, so after this introduction into just the microresonator basics, let me just um, um, talk about kind of the, uh, the process that generates comb, which is parametric oscillations. And so, um, so if you have uh, a nonlinear material that has, um, you know, that is uh, centri um, centrosymmetric, then the second order non entity vanishes, um, and you can express the polarization just as the susceptibility chi, okay, times electric field plus a cubic contribution here. And uh, and the, the key to notice um, that um, the polarization that is uh, cubic in electric field um, can be thought of, or also rigorously common mechanically be derived from a Fourier mixing process. So from a process whereby two pump photons are annihilated and a signal and the ida are generated. Um, and so this uh, chi 3 coefficient um, uh, can be yeah, uh, connected or can be expressed here as linearity in the following way. We can look at the uh, contribution of a nonlinearity that is uh, proportional to the field itself. So I've written any field here as E of omega, so in the Fourier domain. And if you do that, um, what you find is that um, uh, the nonlinear contribution okay, um, that is occurring at the signal frequency itself, so the so-called self phase modulation, would just be 3 times epsilon 0 times chi 3. And if you, um, and the way that um, the kernel nonlinearity is defined is in, in, this, in the following way, that the kernel nonlinearity is nothing else than a change in reflective index that a laser field okay, causes on itself. Okay? So it's the, the self-contribution, so the nonlinear contribution that oscillates with the same frequency omega. And, uh, and that leads then to the following expression for the N2. The N2 is just 3 times chi 3 divided by the refractive index N0. And let me just make one little comment here. Um, uh, there's been a lot of excitement actually at Clio in last years around that little formula because uh, that seems to suggest that the N2 starts to diverge when N0 goes to 0. And uh, so this is related to these ideas of kind of um, yeah, um, epsilon near zero materials, like enium tin oxide, where you can use kind of a divert, when your N approaches uh, a zero near material resonance, um, uh, there is a, yeah, uh, a, at least this formula seems to suggest that N2 starts to, starts to, um, starts to diverge. Now, um, for all the materials I'm going to describe today, this is not the case. Material resonance are very far away. Um, and um, the reason is very obvious. Uh, whenever you go to material resonance, you also have absorption. So you might maybe benefit from the N2, but um, this benefit comes at the expense of a price and a loss in intensity. So that's why all the care frequency comp uh, kind of work and also supercontinuum work typically is carried out in a regime where you're far from a material resonance. Now let's look at, look at a few coefficients. Um, so I've placed uh, some examples down here. So um, uh, N2 of a few silica is a, is, a, is a good reference to always kind of keep in mind. Um, and if you look at um, uh, some of the values, uh, for example, amorphous silicon here at 1550 
has a value that's seven times, 700 times larger than the N2 of, uh, of, uh, of SI2. Silicon nitride is about 10 times larger and uh, strongly doped uh, germanium glass about five times higher. Okay. Um, um, gallium phosphide, um, a semiconductor with a band cap of 2 EV, has um, an N2 that's about 100 times larger than that of glass. So these are significantly higher. And, and therefore, if you make waveguides from either silicon or silicon nitride or gallium phosphide, you'll typically have a much larger kernel linearity. Now, um, the way you can um, express parameter gain is typically uh, in the so-called gamma parameter. And I'll have it on the next slides. It's uh, proportional to N2, but divided by the mode area. And here's actually where um, tight confinement really helps because this gamma effective can be vastly increased over comp compared to conventional fibers if you tightly confine light. So if you have, for instance, a silicon nitride waveguide, you can actually make that uh, um, uh, gamma parameter you know, to be 1.4 uh, inverse watt inverse meter. And that's typically about a factor of 100 larger than what you have in standard optical fiber. So you are, you are much more um, a kind of nonlinear parametric gain per, um, uh, per watt of power in a, in a meter compared to optical fiber. OK, so um, um, I'll be um, here quite brief, but I still want to mention one um, very nice reference, OK, um, actually on parametric amplification and frequency conversion fibers by Roger Stolen uh, at Bell Labs. Um, and, um, uh, and the only um, thing I want to mention is that if you want to describe uh, parametric frequency conversion fibers, um, this is a process by which you have okay, four optical fields in theory. Okay? And uh, one of the fields is called signal, or the Stokes. One field is called anti-Stokes. These are symmetric around the pump. And then the pump itself can either be degenerate okay, at the same frequency, or it can be at different frequencies. So that's why it's here F1 and F2. And uh, all the terms, um, one, so how, do you kind of, how can you derive from first principles the equations of motion that describe for mixing? What you would do is you would have your optical wave equation. You have on the right-hand side the nonlinear term you plug in. And there's one thing that deserves attention, and that's the phase matching condition. And naively, you would think that in order to phase match a parametric process, what you need to do is you need to make the wave factor mismatch between okay, the, the, the delta k of the pumps and the signal at idler. So here, anti-stokes and stokes, you need to make those, those zero. But in fact, it's not the case. Um, um, because there's another term here, uh, this, this delta k, and this comes from the fact that um, there is cross and self phase modulation, and these two effects are not the same. So self phase modulation is uh, twice as weak as cross phase modulation. So cross phase modulation is stronger. And that means, actually, that um, the pump fields are changing the propagation constants of the signal and also the anti-stokes, so stokes and anti-stokes. And that change is twice as large as a change in prob um, that uh, pump field causes on itself. And that causes actually here this, this delta k to appear. And uh, if you now plot kind of the, uh, um, um, the parametric kind of amplification, um, so when you inject kind of a signal at the idler into, into a waveguide, what you will see is that um, you have an exponential amplification. Okay, you have a gain coefficient. Um, and this gain coefficient has typically kind of this form of these gain lobes, parametric gain lobes. And these parametric gain lobes um, have one interesting feature. Um, that is to say that um, you're, um, you can actually tolerate or you need a certain amount of wave vector mismatch to derive the maximum gain. So what you see here in this graph here is that the delta k, the wave vector mismatch, okay, needs to be non-zero to get parametric gain. Okay. So the stronger you pump, the larger this, this wave vector mismatch needs to be. And this is, again, just due to the fact that you have cross and self-phase modulation, which change, actually, okay, the wave factor of the signal idle and pump in a, in a different amount. Now, um, now, how does this translate now to kind of the frequency domain? So this kind of original treatment here, and I'll be, be you know, uh, purpose, purposefully brief. In this treatment here um, of uh, parametric frequency conversion in an optical waveguide, what you do is, Okay, you just launch kind of two pump fields and look at signal idler field, how it gets amplified. And um, so the, um, um, the, the, the quantity of interest in this case are your wave vectors. Now in a micro resonator or, or in a cavity, um, typically actually the role of the wave vector is replaced by the role of the cavity eigenfrequency. And so um, if you have now the same picture, you have resonances. Okay, this is your cavity progression. You have a pump field, omega p, okay? 
Now you have an idler frequency and a signal frequency. They are symmetric. They can undergo four wave mixing. Okay. And so how would the uh, um, how would you describe now the nonlinear fre parametric frequency conversion process? Well, um, first of all, um, you have to think about the eigenmodes, and the eigenmodes of a wispin Gallery resonator, they are angular momentum eigenstates. Okay. And so what you have is you have e i l phi, and these are in, where l is an integer number and phi is a smooth kind of coordinate. Okay, so these are so-called angular momentum kind of yeah, it's angular momentum eigen mode of the cavity, and omega t is the optical frequency dependence. And so here, the one aspect to understand now is that l you can think about as just the angular momentum of the mode and omega the eigen frequency. And in the Fourier mixing process, okay, um, if you mix two pump photons with a signal and idler in the in the way that is described here, this process automatically satisfies momentum conservation. And why is that? Because the pump mode we pump here has an angular momentum L. The angular momentum of the higher frequency mode is L plus 1. The one of the lower one is L minus 1. So the angular momentum difference here is plus 1 and here it's minus 1. So it's conserved. So angular momentum is intrinsically conserved in actually a microresonator. Okay. Um, this is opposite to the fiber case because in the fiber case the equivalent of angular momentum is linear momentum. That's not conserved. Okay. So the rules actually are, are reversed compared to the, to the waveguide case. Now the second thing we have to worry about is frequency. Okay? We have the pump mode, the signal mode, and the idler mode. And that frequency is not always a priori conserved because you might have dispersion. So the cavity modes might be anharmonic. And so how can you kind of capture that in an, uh, in an, uh, uh, mathematically? So you can capture this mathematically by going back to the coupled mode equations that we derived before. Okay, this, uh, this is, there's the cavity decay rate kappa over 2. There's a pump term, that's by the chronicle delta. We just have a CW pump. And uh, the term I've introduced here, these are the, the, all the four mixing terms. So all these terms here are nothing else than the different mixing products okay, between the, th the three fields that you have here, the pump field, the signal, and the idler. And if all the uh, fields are the same, you talk about surface modulation. Okay? If the fields are different, um, then you have terms that describe the cross-phase modulation um, or the, the parametric gain. Now the coefficient that um, uh, in front here, this this g, that's the care coefficient g, and this has a very physical meaning. <coughs> this care coefficient is nothing else than the frequency shift per photon. So if you had one cap one photon in the cavity, how much does the cavity shift due to the care nonlinearity? And that typically is a very very small number. So that number is typically on a level of kind of just hertz. So it's a very kind of weak, um, weak, uh, weak contribution. Now um, if you want to simulate now. Um, the frequency conversion process in terms of Fourier mixing. This equation in the middle, that's kind of your master equation. That's all there is. That describes every kind of CARECOM generation experiment. Okay, all you have is a mode with a certain eigenmode number, mu. Every mode can decay. Here in this case, I've assumed the decay to be the same for all the modes. There is a Kronecker delta because one of the eigenmodes is pumped. Okay, and then there is a sum, okay, a triple sum here, of all the mu's and these describe all the mixing processes that are possible. And if you wanted to, for instance, simulate now CARECOM generation numerically, what you have to do is you have to do a split step method where you numerically integrate okay, each mode and step it forward in time. And as well described, there's open source packages that you can use to actually numerically propagate these equations. Um, so um, in a nutshell, um, you have um, two conservation laws. So you have the angular momentum mismatch that I mentioned already is intrinsically for four if mixing is satisfied, but the frequency difference delta omega does not have to be zero. And in fact, you need some frequency mismatch delta omega in order for the four if mixing to be phase matched. Again, due to the fact that cross and self as modulation uh, are, are different. And so here, just uh, for the sake of completeness, uh, put down the coupled mode equation for the pump, the signal, and the idler. Okay, and what you can see here is. Um, again, uh, um, you, you, um, you, what you find here is that you have uh, uh, self as modulation, cross as modulation that appear here with different coefficients, and you have the uh, corresponding parametric oscillation terms that give you kind of gain. And, um, and the delta L is a momentum mismatch, and um, for the case of symmetrically spaced modes, actually this, this delta L is equal to zero, and so it's just equal to unity, so you're, 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 you're phase matched. Now these equations, and um, this is also evident, um, uh, they're not completely trivial to solve because, in fact, delta omega is time dependent here. 
So you have to go into a rotating frame that is uh, kind of stationary. And what you find at the end is that you get, again, these parametric gain lobes. And, um, and you need a certain amount of detuning or cavity detuning delta omega um, in order to get a non-zero parametric gain. And so this delta omega is the amount of dispersion that our cavity has. And it needs to be positive, we need to have animal CVD. And gamma times E, that's actually our nonlinear frequency shift, okay, induced by the pump. And so what you see here is that the maximum gain, or the stronger you pump, the more actually nonlinear frequency shift that you need, okay, for the, to, to derive the maximum gain. And, um, <coughs> and um, so um, what you can next do is you can equate your gain coefficient to the cavity decay rate. And you find an expression actually for the parametric threshold. And it's generally quite complicated. And the reason uh, the, the threshold is complicated is, is that you also have the laser frequency as a free variable. So, um, so it's the, the laser doesn't have to be on resonance with the cavity. It can also be detuned. And that makes the entire expression actually rather cumbersome. Now, um, gladly, however, there's a very kind of simple way um, to derive the parametric threshold within a factor of two by noting that the parametric threshold okay, coincides with the care frequency shift being equal to about half the line width. Okay, so if, the, if you pump the cavity, there's a care frequency shift of the cavity mode. When that equals a kappa over 2, that actually coincides with the threshold of the parametric instability. And if you um, and um, and why is it a factor, Why is it kappa over two? It's actually it has to do with the fact that you run into so-called bi-stability. The cavity becomes nonlinear. It starts tilting. I have an image on that, and um, and that actually is when fluctuations are amplified and you generate signal on either side bands. Now, one um, thing that deserves notion is that the threshold for this parametric oscillation scales with inverse Q squared. Okay, and that's actually rather surprising, because in a conventional laser system, okay, you would think that um, the gain equals the loss would imply that you have a 1 over Q dependence on the threshold. But in any parametric oscillator, it's 1 over Q squared. And the reason it's 1 over Q squared is that the gain is also intensity dependent. So if you have a higher buildup of the cavity field due to a large Q, okay, so you draw this quadratic you know, benefit in, 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 in pump power reduction. Um, what's shown here is an example um, of an experiment um, where there's a microresonator pump with a strong kind of pump laser. And you see here the parametric frequency conversion into signal and idler. Um, these two are you know, correlated. These are you know, twin photon pairs. So you have the same amount of uh, uh, photons in the signal and idler. Um, and you can also see secondary sidebands here from the, from the Fourier mixing. What you can also look at is um, what the minimum threshold is for a parametric oscillator. And that threshold occurs slightly undercoupled, okay, exactly what you would expect from, a, from an analysis based on the, on the coupling I've mentioned before. Um, so, if you now, how can you generate optical combs with this process? Well, um, two sidebands um, would not be sufficient, obviously, to generate a, a broadband comb. However, the way you can generate a comb is by making use of um, the, um, the non-degenerate Fourier mixing. So, once you have generated a signal on either sidebands, okay, you can have uh, a mixing process appearing. It generates higher order sidebands that can cascade. And these um, will then um, inherit kind of the mode spacing of the, of the, force, of the first four of mixing products. And you can generate a broadband comb. And, um, and this was demonstrated already yeah, quite some time ago, about 12 years ago. And, um, and how can you demonstrate that these, actually these comb teeth here are equidistant? The way you can do that is again using a fiber laser frequency comb to measure the distances between comb teeth. And so in this example, um, what was used was an SR2 microresonator um, from silica. And it had a diameter of 80 micron. And that translates into a mode spacing of about a terahertz. Okay? And so a terahertz, you cannot measure with a photodetector. So in this case, what you can do is you can take a femtosecond laser comb to bridge the mode spacing okay, between, say, um, uh, three different adjacent modes and measure if the, beta measure, um, if the two um, um, FSRs agree and subtract them from each other. And you can form a histogram. And this histogram actually shows that the deviation of two consecutive FSRs is, in this case, less than 5 millihertz. So this is um, uh, you know, effectively limited just by how long you average and how well you can statistically determine the center of your, your Gaussian distribution, which in principle improves just by averaging. And uh, so this proves that this process does give you kind of an optical comb. 
Now, one common misconception with the comb is that the comb itself is not necessarily, doesn't mean that um, you have um, perfectly rigid mode spacing. So in this example here, each of the comb T's still fluctuate, but the key is that they fluctuate in unison. And that means that if you determine and count the distance between one free spectral range, free spectral range on one side and one free spectral range on the other, those fluctuate okay, exactly in a correlated fashion. So the comb itself doesn't have any stability. You can think about it as a rubber band, okay, which, you, which you pull. Okay, but the key is that the fluctuations in the free spectral range, they are correlated. Um, so <clears throat> the comb in a micro layer deviates or differs um, in a, from a femtosecond laser in a number of ways. Um, and one way in which it differs is that the pump laser itself is part of the spectrum. Okay, so the, if you, you, you pump um, uh, with a CW, la CW a, a microresonator, and um, the pump laser itself now becomes part of the comb spectrum, and that means automatically also if you change the pump laser's frequency, you will also change in effect, okay, to some degree this carrier envelope frequency, okay, um, because um, in a non-trivial way the pump laser frequency will influence both the absolute kind of comb, this comb offset as well as the mode spacing. And um, now another degree of freedom that you have is the pump power. And the pump power typically causes, via the temperature dependent refractive index, the free spectral range to vary. Okay? And that's why if you take the pump frequency and pump power as the two parameters, you can actually control both the repetition rate and the comb spacing. Okay? And uh, so what's the source of the, uh, the, 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 the initial uh, shift, like the carrier um, so the, yeah, you can think again, um, uh, the source again is the difference in the group and phase velocity of light inside the resonator. So it will give you, um, um, at, that, at, a, at a particular carrier frequency, that will determine kind of what your effective carrier envelope frequency is. And uh, or also equivalently ex expressed, um, if you have the full dispersion landscape, okay, you can compute, okay, what will you be your, be your mode spacing, and you know what pump uh, frequency you have, so you can extrapolate what your FCO will be. But, um, and, um, and in this case, what's, um, what is shown is that if you kind of, yeah, with both the pump frequency and, uh, and pump power, you can control kind of these two degrees of freedom. And there's some early experiments where the uh, microresonator was completely phase stabilized. Now, um, uh, one thing I want to mention just for completeness <coughs> is that uh, you can derive um, all the force mixing equations also just from a Hamiltonian. And the Hamiltonian description um, can, uh, can sometimes be quite useful because it's a very compact notation because if you have three modes A, B plus and B minus then uh, the interaction Hamiltonian of these four modes is just given by um, uh, all the modes A, B uh, and B minus to the, um, to the fourth power here and this to the fourth power just denotes again the fact that we have a fourth mixing product. Okay, so what we have here is that we have different mixing products and uh, of course, um, only those products here are retained that satisfy energy conservation. So where the frequency in the process is conserved. And then uh, to our order, in order to get your um, equations of motion, again, um, you just yeah, you know, take the Hamiltonian, you, do, you, know, uh, you apply the Heisenberg equation of motion, and then um, you get the equation for A, the pump field, B plus and B minus. And again, you get a whole expansion of in a, in a series of, of, of terms. And if you can look carefully, what you see is you can recover again the self modulation the pump acting on itself, the pump acting on B plus, pump acting on B minus, and there's this factor of two here that self phase modulation is larger than cross phase modulation. So you can, um, and, and this approach would, is, is another way how you can just derive the, the, the equation of motion for your, for your, for your fields. So um, what I mentioned and alluded to earlier is that um, um, the parametric threshold is related to biostability. And I wanted to, um, to mention that um, here pictorially in, in the following way. So um, what's shown here on the horizontal axis is the pump laser detuning, and on the vertical axis, the intracavity power. So if you have an optical resonator and you scan across its resonance, what you would expect is just to see is a Lorentzian, line, Lorentzian profile. Now, um, when you start coupling light into the resonator, you also experience a care frequency shift, okay, due to self-phase modulation. So that means, actually, that the cavity gets redshifted, okay, because the refractive index starts to increase for positive N2. And this leads to something that um, is called the care tilt. So the, the original kind of uh, um, uh, symmetric, vertically symmetric uh, Lorentzian starts now to become tilted towards the red detuned side. 
And uh, at the point where the care frequency shift okay, exceeds the cavity line width, okay, this is what you call the modulation stability threshold. Okay, that's the threshold at which these parametric sidebands start to actually oscillate. Okay, just, just like in a conventional laser. And uh, in principle, you can also uh, operate above that threshold. So in this example here, okay, the power is much larger than the threshold for these parametric oscillations. And so that would imply that um, already when you climb up here, this, uh, this intracavity power field already at this stage here, you would start oscillating. Okay? And all this region here is bistable. That is to say, and we'll come back to that later, that there is two different solutions for one okay, given pump power and one given detuning. And this actually will, ha will have later on a quite important role because this region where you have this bistability, um, we call this the upper branch and this the lower branch, this region is the one where you can form solitons. Okay? Um, so whenever you have a bistability, you can support a so-called lower branch that is, for instance, a continuous wave laser, an upper branch which could be a pulse, Okay, in the case of a bright soliton, or in the case of a dark soliton, the roles would be reversed. There would, the upper branch would be a CW solution, the lower branch would be actually a, a, a dip in your, in your background. So this region here is a region okay, where solitons can form, where you re reach a so-called bistability. The region on the left here, which is sort of blue detuned, this we call the modulationally unstable region. So um, again, um, uh, what I, I just put it here for completeness, but um, uh, what I want to show in this graph here is um, uh, in proof, and I've just put it here for completeness, that indeed the threshold for parametric oscillation okay, actually coincides okay, with this onset of bistability. And so let's only focus for a moment on, on, on the graphics here. Okay? So you can see here, again, um, this tilted cavity resonance. Okay? And what you see here um, is different powers Okay, and the power of uh, 1.54, this corresponds actually to the threshold. And if you look very precisely, what you see is, you see that at this point for this red curve, okay, the system starts to become bistable, exactly at that point. So if you go actually further to the blue solution, the blue is already bistable, meaning that you have two solutions for a given pump detuning here. Okay, and the red one is exactly okay, the onset of the bistability. And this is a so-called yeah, bifurcation, a bifurcation point. Exactly that bifurcation point is the point where you start to parametrically oscillate. So you see, I, rather, or, so what I want to point out here is that there's some very interesting relation between the care bistability, okay, and parametric oscillations. Okay, the bistability itself, okay, is the reason you have parametric oscillations because small fluctuations will start to be exponentially amplified right at the point where the cavity becomes bistable. And operating beyond the bistability, therefore, is the, allows you to generate parametric sidebands. Okay? And moreover, the bistability region is exactly the region where also you can, can form temporal solitons. And that's a universal scheme. Um, and just a small historic remark, um, in the microwave domain, and the microwave engineering literature, you will find the terminology of a bifurcation amplifier. And, uh, and uh, why, do, why in a microwave domain our amplifiers called bifurcation amplifiers for exactly this reason, because this point where you become bistable, that's a bifurcation. And uh, that bifurcation makes small fluctuations unstable and leads to amplification. So that's why such amplifiers are also called yeah, microwave bifurcation amplifiers. Um, okay, so um, the parametric oscillations, um, you can drive them very strongly. So you can drive them very, very you know, far in this care-tilted resonance, very far above threshold. And um, what happens then is you generate very, very broadband optical frequency combs. Okay? And uh, initially, okay, such combs cause a lot of excitement in the field um, because they hint at the way to generate broadband combs. But the key question is, are such combs coherent? And if you take such a spectrum as shown here and you put it in a photodetector, what you find is that the RF beat node actually is very noisy. Noisy being here that it contains a significant amount of you know, power spectral density. And so where does this noise originate from? And this noise originates, by the way, this noise is universal. So this is an example of a magnesium fluoride resonator, a resonator made from silicon nitride. What you see here is the optical spectrum, and here you see the RF spectrum. And there's something rather interesting happening. Is as you pump the resonator and generate sidebands, these sidebands slowly fill in, generate a very dense comb. But as the comb is filling in with optical lines, you see also that the RF beat node which initially is, is, is uh, very nice and coherent, starts 
to develop sidebands and then develop in this very noisy kind of comp line or, or, or beat, note, uh, beat note width. So clearly what happened here is that you have lost coherence. And, um, and now um, to put this in a quantitative, um, quantitative terms, in frequency metrology, the way you define coherence or uh, so uh, is the following. You ask yourself, can you still count that beat note? And counting means the following. You take that beat note on a frequency domain, but you plot it on a, you, you just monitor it on a, on, a, on a oscilloscope. And as long as you can see the zero crossings of your cosine functions, you can still count the signal. But if the signal becomes very noisy, it means simply it has a lot of very fast Fourier fluctuations. And, um, and once you're, you're running out of bandwidth and you can't see the zero crossings anymore, you can't count. And typically, you know, uh, in a, in colloquially speaking, you need to have at least 20 dB signal to noise in 100 kilohertz with a, you know, 100 picosecond counter to, to, do, to count the RF beat notes. So a beat note here that's a, you know, a few megahertz wide and has only 10 dB of signal to noise is something you cannot count on, a, on an electronic counter. So you've lost coherence. So where does it come from, this loss of coherence? It comes from the fact that parametric oscillations um, in a microresonator, um, uh, in fact, they proceed slightly more complicated. And um, in gray is sh are shown here all kind of the cavity modes of the resonator. Okay, and now we remember that the parametric gain lobes are offset from zero. Okay, so the maximum gain you typically have, don't have on the, the first comb teeth, but if you pump strongly, actually parametric gain maximizes very far away from the optical pump. Okay. And how far does it um, peak? Well, it peaks approximately kappa over D2. So what's kappa here? Kappa is the cavity decay rate. D2 is the dispersion parameter. And now is something um, uh, immediately evident. If you have, say, a microresonator that's made, for instance, you know, it has a low Q, it has a large cavity decay rate. And imagine the microresonator has very low dispersion. Okay? That ratio will be quite large. It can be 10 to 100. That means that the first sidebands actually are, very, are generated very far away from the optical pump. Okay? Now, um, when that happens, in principle, everything is still fine. You have a perfectly coherent comb. That those sidebands can also cascade, and it gives you what's called a primary comb. But um, once those comb teeth have a significant amount of power, okay, um, another process takes over, which is not non-degenerate Fourier mixing, where the pump photons are the same, but non-degenerate Fourier mixing. And so where you, where you do the following, you take a pump photon from the pump, you take a pump photon from the idler, okay, and you generate two new ones that are lower frequency and higher frequency. Yeah? So one here, one here, and then either to the right or to the left. So this is a non-degenerate um, kind of mixing scheme. And what will that will do is it will generate subcombs that all have the same free spectral range, but uh, the carrier envelope frequency of all these kind of combs is different. It's not in the same grid. So now when these combs start to merge, what it means is that you have multiple comb teeth filling in one cavity resonance. Okay, so it's a very non-intuitive situation. So you have a comb where suddenly each cavity resonance, okay, sees multiple comb teeth. And that's precisely actually what, um, what, what's shown here in this last graph. In gray here is a resonance that we measured, okay. And what you see on the bottom here is a reconstruction of all the, all the light content in that resonance. And you can see here there are many, many optical modes actually inside that optic resonance. And so these are many, many combs that are bleeding together and give you much more than one comb teeth per comb line. So it's a very complex kind of, kind of situation. Now in here, um, um, something quite um, uh, yeah, striking happens. So intuitively, you would, it would not be evident at all okay, how the system can still find a state where all this kind of, all these erratically looking optical fields at different frequencies, how they would cut up into one single frequency. But it turns out there's a process in nature um, that's a very ubiquitous process, and that's a process of forming dissipative structure or self-organization, spatial temporal self-organization that takes place that can find attractors where all these erratically kind of uh, um, uh, all these all these fields that are being generated still collapse into a into an attractor, and um, and that's a process of um, of um, yeah um, of salt information that I'll describe, and um, and so again to, to corroborate this point, uh, let me just show you two spectra here. 
So, um, so these are two different spectra. On the left here um, is an optical comb generated where all the optical frequencies are reconstructed. And um, they're plotted here in a shell type plot. And this means that a horizontal line means equidistant modes. Um, so this is the case on the left, uh, sorry, on the right. But on the left here, you see different kind of modes. Um, and it's offset here. So this means you have several subcombs. All these subcombs are in themselves frequency combs. That's why they're horizontal lines. But they're offsets, and that means that they're actually offset from each other. So this is, is, and so in this case here, for instance, if you look at one optical mode, you would see multiple lines falling under, under one Lorentzian. So this clearly is not an optical comb. But if you tune the system, what you find is that all the comb trees in the spectrum that was generated here start to align. And you have a kind of fully coherent optical state. And the question is, what makes a system synchronized? What's the underlying reason that a comb state suddenly transitions from being kind of in this multiple subcombs <coughs> into a fully coherent state? And, um, and the reason what happens here is, is actually a salt transformation. And so what's shown here is the transmission past an optical microresonator. And so what you see is you start coupling light into the resonator. At some point, you exceed the bisability criteria that I mentioned earlier. You generate parametric sidebands. So cob lines start to be generated. These cob lines become noisy as the subcombs fill up. Okay? And if you tune further, okay, past the, the, the highest point of your tilted resonance, okay, the transmission starts to recover again, and you start to see steps. Okay, and these steps here are concomitant with very kind of low noise in the RF beat notes. So the beat note that's color coded here, that's very wide in this modulation stability regime due to subcombs, suddenly starts to, to kind of collapse. And this behavior has been observed before and has been observed in a different field and has been observed in the field actually of, um, of yeah, uh, superconducting microwave cavities driven by RF tones and is referred to as multi-stability. And so here you see power input, power output through a microwave cavity. And you see here this typical kind of snaking behavior with, uh, with, with, a, with bistable kind of curves where transmission is not constant as a function of frequency. Uh, sorry, as a um, there's no linear relationship between input and output, but rather these discontinuities. And these discontinuities are also seen here. So what are these discontinuities? These con discontinuities are associated with the formation of solitons. So the cavity itself actually starts to self-organize. So all these kind of frequency components that you've seen start to collapse into, into uh, well-defined kind of waveforms. And, um, and these solitons appear uniquely on this red detuned, detuned side. So if you remember this carotilted resonance, in this bistable region, you're red detuned. And you can verify that by doing a pound tube hall locking scheme. And, um, and you see actually these steps here are only occurring here on the red detuned side. Okay, where the PDH error signal tells us that we are, we are um, to, to yeah, lower frequency from the, from the cavity side. Um, so if we stop and halt on one of these points, okay, what we find is that um, uh, we can generate a single secant hyperbolic spectral envelope soliton uh, on top of a C CW kind of pump laser. Okay. And, uh, and so that's when you exactly stop in the, in the right moment. I'll, I'll, I'll explain how we can do that. And uh, so these are solitons um, driven by a CW laser. Their duration, again, depends on the, de on the detune, the dispersion of the cavity, and the frequency detuning, and the free spectral range. And in this example here, this is about a 25 femtosecond, uh, sorry, a 100 femtosecond pulse um, uh, with a 70 picosecond round trip time corresponding to this kind of centimeter scale kind of crystal. Now, let me briefly before um, taking a break here, um, um, give an, an explanation, actually, of what these states are. Because these states here are solitons. Um, and um, they're a special type of soliton. They're so-called dissipative solitons. And so solitons um, have a very kind of um, rich and interesting history. Um, and um, so um, the first kind of solitons <coughs> that were kind of discovered um, were discovered by, um, or so-called, yeah, um, or we should say, one important kind of um, discovery in the context and history of solitons um, has been the observation in the 50s 
of the so-called breather soliton. And so what are breather solitons? So in the 50s, um, um, these were just the time when large-scale numerical computations were um, getting, uh, getting used, and they were getting used actually for the Manhattan Project for calculating kind of configuration of state space of neutrons. And, um, and at the time, uh, uh, Pasta, Fermi, Ulam, and Singu, they um, observed a very interesting behavior if you study nonlinear coupled oscillators. Okay? And what they observed is that if you have oscillators that are mutually coupled, you would intuitively expect that all these oscillators would, in the long time limit, just obtain KBT over 2 of energy, so just equal partition. However, what they found is if they render simulations that, in fact, the energy of the system okay, would not thermalize, so the, each oscillator would not obtain KBT over 2 energy over time, but rather they would see that the energy would be periodically okay, um, um, uh, excursing, uh, would, would, would take excursions through, through different oscillators that would be coupled and return to initial conditions. And this, in fact, is a, nothing else than a breather soliton. A breather soliton is a, a temporally reoccurring state. And so in, th in these systems, uh, there's no thermalization. Okay? And this was the observation, the first observation of so-called breather solitons. So 10 years after this uh, Fermi, Pasta, Ulam, uh, Tsingau um, uh, observation, um, Kruschka and uh, uh, Zabuski, um, they yeah, published a paper, and they also introduced the name of a soliton, the term soliton. It was introduced by them in 1965. And again, they were looking at numerical solutions of, in this case, the quarter effective freeze equation. So again, paradigmatic equation for, for nonlinear dynamics. And then in 74, um, they extended the analysis also um, to a physical system, in this case, to, to, to plasmas. And they showed that actually that in driven plasmas, you can actually have the observation of such, such solitons. Now, solitons in optical, uh, in optical domain were first uh, observed in the 1980s. Um, this was by Mona, Zastor, and Gordon at Bell Labs. Um, and uh, the, um, this is an example here of their temporal solitons. So these were light pulses li uh, that were launched into an optical fiber, and they preserved their shape over, uh, over, over distance. Now, um, in addition to temporal solitons, there's also a close cousin that is called spatial solitons. This is an example here of the first spatial solitons that were observed. These were observed in waveguides that were coupled. And these solitons are now not um, uh, um, preserving their shape over uh, the distance, but rather over the transverse extents. So these, were, um, these are different coupled waveguides. And what you can see is above a certain critical power, okay, the uh, waveguides cross-section all, all show here the same um, kind of uh, spatial distribution of energy uh, and counteract the dispersion um, that is caused by the coupling among mutual waveguides. Now, um, very briefly, uh, only in a, in, a, in, a, in a nutshell, I mean, the field of soliton propagation is, is very vast. So there's a, a lot of um, um, kind of um, yeah, vast landscape of, uh, of material, also that extends into applied mathematics. And, um, but it's, sophisticated or it's sufficient maybe to mention that generally um, solitons um, uh, or pure so-called integral solitons are system where, first of all, you neglect loss. So these are equations here where you just look at the propagation of, say, your field U, okay, in, say, spatial dimension Z, uh, under the influence of some dispersion. So this is the second order operator here in time. And there's a nonlinearity, which is here cubic. And this system have no losses um, uh, introduced. And in this case, there's two types of solution you can distinguish. And the two solutions depend actually on the sign of S. Okay, of your, so you can either have a system where you have a focusing nonlinearity or defocusing nonlinearity. And um, if you have a nonlinearity that is focusing, you generate bright solitons. If you have a defocusing nonlinearity, you generate dark solitons. And, uh, and, what's, um, and, and this equation here, and this is kind of the, the beautiful aspect of this equation, this has, can be solved um, precisely. Okay? It has an analytic solution, and it's a sick and hyperbolicus for the case of a bright soliton. And you can, you can convince yourself by just plugging in the, the cos and hyperbolicus in this function and realizing that actually this, you know, it, it will be satisfied for certain choices of the pulse duration and, uh, and amplitude. <coughs> so, um, so this is the equation for the case of s equal to minus 1, that's NML CVD. So this is, describes the propagation along a fiber in the, in the, in, with normalized, uh, renormalized. Um, so this term here is just a, the, the dispersion of the pulse. The second term here is nonlinearity. It's written in this dimensionless form. And uh, the first solution to that equation is a so-called um, yeah, first-order soliton, where it is n equal, is equal to 1. 
And this n here is given by gamma, our non coefficient, times p naught times the dispersion length LD. Okay, and that can be re-expressed as gamma p naught to pulse duration over beta over beta. Yeah. And so this Salter number, if you launch, say, um, a power that exactly corresponds to the first order Salton, that Salton would retain its shape okay, throughout the entire fiber. Now, one thing it's important to realize is this equation actually doesn't have any loss. So it describes the case of what one would call integrable system. Okay? And, um, and uh, of course, this is highly idealized because most systems do have loss. And so a Salton as a function of distance at some point would not be satisfied anymore uh, for the reason that you would lose the power. At some point, actually, you would, uh, you would actually lose the condition for, uh, for, for the first order Salton. This is also called bright Salton. And, um, and um, uh, now this term was contrasted in the 90s um, by another development that was mostly led by Ekmediev, who um, looked at this equation but asked himself, what happens if you actually have loss in the system? Okay, and, um, and so, and if you have loss, um, in order to still sustain a soliton, you need to also have a process that gives gain. And, um, and that's the principle of a dissipative soliton. So a dissipative soliton is a soliton where you have loss, gain, dispersion, and nonlinearity contract each other. And these dissipative solitons are kind of, um, uh, are solitons that are yeah, vastly more relevant to many practical systems because you typically always have an open system. You always have dissipation. And, um, and so these, these so-called dissipative solitons exist in plasma physics, in fiber cavities, in mode lock lasers, uh, also in cloud formation, okay, um, or in, in biological systems. And um, they're um, an extension of this idealized, okay, soliton where you have dispersion and nonlinearity. But now you include several new terms. You include, in, in, first of all, you include a term that accounts for loss. In this case, it's this mi minus i times psi. It's a loss term. And you introduce also a driving term. Okay? So the left-hand side introduces kind of two modifications. One is to account that the system can lose energy and also the fact that the system can gain energy. And there is another uh, term here, this psi, which in principle can be detuning because if you have a drive, you can choose kind of the frequency of your, of your, of, of your drive and that gives another parameter. And, um, and these sautons um, have been first analyzed in 96. Okay? Um, uh, it's called yeah, um, by Barachenkov. It's uh, again driven damped on near Schrodinger equation. And their solutions okay, are what are called dissipative solitons. And, the, uh, um, and, uh, and these, so this, these dissipative solitons are also known under the name of dissipative structures. And um, in addition to Barachenkov, um, a key um, uh, observation has been made by Lugato, who showed that a driven nonlinear cavity can be mapped to exactly the equation I've just shown from Barachenkov. So a driven damped nonlinear Schrodinger equation is nothing else than the reincarnation of a resonator that's driven by a light field in the presence of a care nonlinearity. Now, um, um, it's also interesting to um, look a little more broadly even <coughs> and ask where actually do a lot of these ideas of solitons come from? Where do they play a role? And um, in fact, in the 70s already, uh, Prigozhin was looking at pattern formation in chemical reactions. And um, in fact, the equations that describe chemical reactions Okay, in the presence of linearities, they are exactly the same equation as this lugato lefeva equation. Okay. In fact, the lugato lefeva equation describes dissipative solitons in the optical domain are nothing else than taking the ideas from Prigozhin applied to chemistry and actually transposing them to the optical domain. Yeah? And that was done actually in the, uh, uh, in, in, in the late 70s and beginning of 80s. And that's why um, uh, one also calls the kind of optical self-organization dissipative structure. So it's a term actually that was termed by Prigozhin. So um, I'll, be, um, I'll be more brief on, on this part here. Um, um, so, uh, again, you have a, a damp-driven dissipative nonlinear Schrodinger equation. The solutions of these equations are stable solitons or dissipative solitons. Um, and these are linked to a CW background. And um, you can not only have one soliton in the cavity, but also multiple solitons. And, um, and again, there are always a double balance of dispersion, nonlinearity, gain and loss. And this equation, okay, um, in this normalized form here, uh, is, goes by a name Lulato-Lefeva equation. 
and um, it was uh, yeah, uh, introduced in, 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 in 87 and describes a carriage-driven nonlinear resonator. And so you can actually go from kind of this description of an optical resonator with dispersion, you know, parametric gain, some cavity decay rate, and a detuning. You can go, um, you can simply take this equation, recast it in this form, and you find the so-called LD equation. Okay. Um, okay, I think um, I will actually skip this part here and show rather um, um, one example of numerically um, integrating the um, equations. And what you see here is a typical trajectory where the laser field is scant. And there's the intercavity power. And what you can see here is that intercavity power is rising. You generate modulation stability. You have a region with breather solitons. And then you have different soliton steps here that corresponds to a number of different trajectories in the cavity. And each of these kind of um, steps here corresponds to a certain number of solitons. So this is one, two, three, four. And they kind of are discreetly lining up. And so what you can do now in an actual experiment is you can tune through this excitation sequence and you land on one soliton step. And once you land on a certain step, you can stop the laser and then you know, investigate the state and look at its optical spectrum. So another way to plot this kind of uh, chart is in the following way. You have kind of this so-called bi-stability chart. <clears throat> so what you see here again is the detuning. Okay, that's the intercavity power. And again, this um, lugat favor equation where F is your normalized drive then psi here is the uh, detuning, i comes from the loss, okay, it has several kind of regions. So here you have so-called chaotic regions shown in blue. You have the so-called um, soliton region here in, in, in green. And in between the two, you have so-called breather solitons, where the pulses actually breathe periodically in time. And uh, now, one thing that's not so evident from this diagram here is how to initiate solitons. And the way you need to initiate solitons is you cannot immediately move your laser to a certain detuning and increase the power. What you need to do is, in order to generate soliton, is you need to first generate all these modulationally unstable patterns, this chaotic waveform, and then increase the detuning further, where you transition through the breathing region into the stable soliton region. And um, so the way you have to, to interpret these diagrams is as um, that the pathway, how you excite actually is dependent. So you cannot immediately go from a state of, um, of, of detuning here, 7.5, for instance, into a soliton state, you have to transition actually through this modulation in the unstable region first. Okay, and that's why when there's, there's some caution actually required with the stability charts. So how can you generate solitons now in a resonator? Um, coming back, um, um, so you pump a resonator, you generate first this modulation in the unstable region. Okay, so you transition into that blue region I mentioned. You generate a chaotic waveform. And um, the remarkable aspect is now that if you, once you cross, okay, um, with the laser, the zero detuning, and enter this bistable regime, all this generated light actually forms, okay, this dissipative structure in the form of solitons. And when you start tuning further, you see actually that solitons decay one by one, okay, until for the last step here, you have only one single soliton inside the resonator. So, uh, so this kind of makes use of this, uh, yeah, kind of um, surprising, um, kind of feature of nature that the system starts to self-organize. So even though the original waveform is completely chaotic, and again, a frequency domain can be thought of as many, many kind of non equidistantly sp spaced comb teeth, what the system will try to strive to seek is this um, very strong attractor solution where, uh, where the salt has become kind of stable and then are continuously recirculating. So if you just stop the laser scan here, okay, then again, you can generate a single soliton in the cavity. Note that if you were to try to do this experiment, scanning not from d uh, blue to red, but rather from red to blue, you could not access this state here. Because if you were to do that, what would happen is you would actually just climb up, and then you would never generate sufficient intercavity power to excite actually this modulations, modulation stability pattern. So you have to actually excite from the blue to the side to the red to the in order to access this bi stability state. Now, um, um, accessing this state is not completely, completely uh, trivial. Um, I just put this here for, for comprehensiveness, but in interest of time, I will just skip over it. Um, if you do um, many scans over resonance, what you see is that these solitons are sarcastically generated. And this is something you can already suspect because the spatial self-organization that happens in this bistable regime depends on initial conditions. And so depending, yeah, and if you have a chaotic waveform, every time you reinitiate the system, you'll find different kind of salt trajectories. 
So you form solitons, but how many and where they're positioned, that's kind of random in, in, in the process. Um, and, um, and also the other thing you need to be aware of is that typically the red detune side of a cavity is thermally unstable um, because as the laser frequency starts to, um, uh, starts to, inc starts to decrease, the cavity actually starts to cool, and cooling means actually that the frequency will increase again. And so um, that's why actually this side is typically not thermally stable. And you need to kind of have the right laser scan and laser speed in order to stabilize this, this soliton state. Now, um, <clears throat> I think here is a good point, I think, to, to take kind of a break and also some, 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 some questions. I think there's still tea outside. And, um, and the second part, actually, of the, um, of the um, lecture, I like to talk about applications uh, uh, of, of optical combs and optical silicon frequency combs. Um, and before maybe just finishing, let me just mention that um, um, the numerical simulation of these combs um, can these days actually be done with, with, with codes that are completely freeware. So this is a code that was recently um, put in archive by uh, Kari Srinivasan from NIST, which is a software package that simulates the so-called Gautier-Lefeva equation, where you can put in an arbitrary dispersion profile, okay, and, uh, um, and you can propagate the equations in time using the so-called split-step method that for completeness I also reference in the, in the slide deck, in the slides before. And uh, this software is available on GitHub and the way what it will do is you will give a dispersion profile. So this is, for instance, the profile of the mode frequencies. Okay, you see here some NML CVD and some 2-0 two, two crossings. And if you propagate that code, what you will see is you will see actually the generated optical spectrum inside the cavity and also in the coupler, the waveform, um, and, uh, and um, these spectra are always generated okay, um, for a certain detuning sweep. So what you see here is, you see here actually um, um, the LLE you know, being, being, being propagated and the steps here are nothing else than actually the frequency excursion. So you start to actually generate MI states, generate soliton here, and then at some point you lose the soliton, you have lit the existence range, and, um, and uh, this side here corresponds to modulation and stability, and then this side here corresponds to stable solitons. Okay, and this is again the, the, the generated comb light, this is the time inside the resonator, so here you see a single soliton, and this is the optical spectrum. So here's the MI, it's noisy, this is the stable soliton, and what you can also see is that the soliton drifts as the laser detuning is, is, is varying. And so these kind of simulations now become, yeah, are, are quite simple to carry out. So if you run it on your computer, you can simulate 200 modes or so in a matter of just a few minutes, and then simulate even kind of octave-spanning spectra here with, with two dispersive waves as, as shown here. I want to continue and um, uh, finish off um, the part on solitons in my is by um, doing two things. One is going actually through um, some dynamics of solitons, in particular um, explaining a bit more actually what happens in this region between modulation stability and, and solitons. There's a so-called breather soliton. I want to briefly actually touch on what's happening in this breather regime and what can trigger breather soliton formation. Um, and then discussing some applications of, uh, uh, of soliton microcombs and, some <coughs> and also effects that you take into account when, when simulating them. And then the last part, I'd like to um, uh, um, kind of change gears and uh, discuss pulse propagation in, in, in nonlinear waveguides. Okay, so um, what happens in this region where you have um, these so-called breather solitons? So what happens here is that the solitons, so soliton breathers occur in a um, region between MI and, and stable solitons. And uh, what breather solitons are, <coughs> are periodic uh, modulations <coughs> of the solitons you know, duration, okay, or correspondingly their spectrum. And so uh, this is an example of one breathing period. So what you see here is that the soliton undergoes very, very strong and very significant changes in its duration. So it can be as much as a factor of uh, two or three in the, in the pulse duration. And also it develops kind of this characteristic kind of um, uh, spectral kind of shapes in, in the wings. And if you now take the average of the spectrum, <coughs> the average of the spectrum now is not a sequence hyperbolic anymore, but rather looks like this very, very sharp kind of um, sharp, sharp type of spectrum. So this is characteristic of the breathing state. But in reality, it undergoes this very significant temporal oscillations, okay, that are periodic. 
Now, what's the typical frequency of that of the, those oscillations? Well, that, those depend, in fact, where you are in that bistable regime, and they're typically um, on the on the order of the cavity decay rate. <coughs> so, this is an example here of this uh, of this breathing re regime. So, what you see here is the in blue is you generate um, effectively an MI state. You fall into the Salton regime, and when you tune backwards, what you see is you see this characteristic spiking, and that um, uh, can be seen on a spectrum analyzer as peaks on the repetition rate, and the spectrum also, instead of looking like a sec, starts to look very triangular. So this is characteristic actually of a, of a breather soliton. <clears throat> and uh, this is the same experiment for silicon nitride, so you, do, you tune backwards from the stable soliton regime to the MI, and suddenly you start seeing oscillations in the RF. So it's again an indication of the, of the, of the breather regime. And you see on the rep rate here, um, you see the side bands here appearing that are indicative of the, of the breathing. Now that frequency here is not fixed, but actually will vary. Okay, so it's a, and, and, uh, it's a tunable frequency that becomes smaller the smaller you go in, um, uh, close to the zero-day tuning. Now, um, so this is typically how it looks like. Um, you normally have MI, breather regime, stable salt in the green here. Um, but um, you can also have solitons Salton breathing even in a stable Salton regime. And um, that's something that has become uh, quite clear over recent years. And what happens here is that uh, um, what can happen is that um, when you tune the laser through the Salton existence range, what can happen is that you can have a region where the optical combs line up with other mode families that are not part of the original comb structure. And uh, if you have a little bit of coupling to higher order mode families, those can also trigger kind of Salton breathing behavior. And, uh, and that's been observed <coughs> um, in, in experiments. So what you see here is a, a mode family that has, yeah, that's our primary mode family. In green, red, and purple, these are, you know, is, a, is, a, is one mode family, okay, that um, priority wraps around with the free spectral range. And so you can have a mode, mode crossings. And these avoided mode crossings can also trigger salt on breathing, actually, in the stable regime. And so that's kind of one, one non-trivial modification that comes from, from avoided mode crossings. And uh, so this is an example of the experiment. So what you see here is you uh, first generate with four detuning a soliton. Okay, that's very stable. Okay, that's shown in green. And then in this region, okay, that is still in the soliton existence range where you normally are stable, what you see is there is um, a breathing that you can observe on the oscilloscope. On the, on the, and, and you see a periodic exchange of power between the soliton shown in blue and the avoid mode crossing here shown in red. So this mode crossing here, okay, actually takes energy from the soliton. And for certain detuning ranges, um, there is a periodic exchange of energy between the soliton and the dispersive wave. And that causes the entire system to become unstable. Okay. Um, and that shows that for soliton formation, it's actually very important to have very clean mode spectra and um, uh, have no avoid mode crossings because these mode crossings can trigger this breathing behavior even in the stable salt and existence range. Um, this is an experiment that kind of proves um, uh, this behavior. So here you see a um, salt and spectrum um, with two avoided mode crossings, one here at mode 47, one at mode uh, 98. And what's done here with the wave shaper is you measure the power of these two modes, okay, and you plot an oscilloscope. And what you see is the following. You see, in blue, the periodic power oscillation of the, of the soliton. Um, it's not constant, so it's indicative of a breathing state. But what you see is that for mode 47, so the one here, the power is out of phase. So that means that there's a periodic exchange of power between the soliton and this devoted mode crossing. In contrast, this one here at A9, actually the power in the soliton and the power in the dispersive wave here are in phase. So in fact, <coughs> this is not actually breathing causing breathing, this is just part of the breathing oscillation. In contrast, 47 here, that's the one that's responsible for triggering the breathing behavior. And why does this mode um, uh, trigger breathing and this doesn't? And this depends actually on the relative offset that the modes have compared to our actually uh, original kind of frequency grid. So if the, if the avoid mode crossing of this mode is stronger than on the green mode, actually it's the strongest mode that kind of induces the triggering of the, of the, of the, um, uh, of the breathing oscillation. Now, um, another effect um, that can exist, and is perhaps uh, one of the most important um, nonlinear effects that, that has been described, is the so-called dispersive wave formation. Okay? And dispersive wave formation is um, a modification of the soliton due to higher order dispersion. 
And this effect was first described <coughs> by Carson and Agmediev in a seminal paper in, in 94. And what they did is they solved the nonlinear Schrodinger equation in the presence of third order dispersion. Okay, so it, where you have not just a quadratic contribution but a cubic contribution. And what they showed is that the soliton, instead of just being the second subabolic, starts to pick up a tail that is oscillatory that's either bound to the trailing edge or the leading edge of the pulse. It depends on the sign actually of the, of the third order dispersion. And, um, and this effect, um, uh, about uh, yeah, five, six years later, turned out to be um, uh, uh, very uh, essential because this effect is the reason that you can generate a supercontinuum that is coherent octave spanning. And it turns out that uh, in the, in, so the spectrum I've shown here is from the original paper from Ranka uh, in, 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 two, in 2000, where he launched a femtosecond laser pulse into a photonic crystal fiber. And what came out of that fiber was an octave spanning spectrum with a dispersive wave in the visible. And the reason you have this uh, visible dispersive wave is precisely okay, because of the third order dispersion term. So in fact, the third order dispersion term uh, uh, that was induced by the PCF gave you actually this, uh, um, this, this um, very unusual situation where um, you extend into the visible. So I should mention that normally here in the visible you have normal dispersion and that's exactly what is the case. This region here is the normal dispersion uh, part of the optical fiber and it's preceded by an anomalous GVD region and, uh, and that allows actually to generate the dispersive wave. So um, how does the dispersive wave formation appear in microresonators? Um, in a very similar fashion. So this is a numerically simulated spectrum where you have a normal anomalous GVD window in the telecom band. You have a normal GVD window here around 2 micron. Mm -hmm. And what you see is that instead of having just a secant subbolic spectral envelope, you see actually that the soliton has this characteristic oscillatory tail. And that tail turns out to be a, this spectral feature here in the, in the long wavelength range. And in time domain, it is bound to the soliton. Now, <coughs> this uh, um, oscillatory feature can either be bound to the trailing or leading edge of the soliton, and, and you can also have a situation where you have two dispersive waves, that is to say where the, um, the soliton has oscillatory tails to both leading and trailing edge. And in that case, the spectrum would actually have, would be symmetric. So um, uh, this is an experimental observation of such a, such a spectrum in a microresonator made from silicon nitride. And so what's plotted here is the optical spectrum, and in green, um, is the so-called yeah, Lugato-Lefeva equation um, um, that includes here the second order dispersion term and also the third order dispersion term. And if you now plot this d int, so the integrated dispersion for this microresonator, you will have um, the NMLS GVD region at 1550. And in fact, what you have uh, at around um, yeah at around 100 uh, yeah 85 terahertz the dispersion starts to switch signs, so it goes from anomalous GVD to normal, okay, so the curvature changes of the graph here, and um, you have this point here, which is the d int equals zero point. Now what is this d int equals zero point? This is the point when the modes of the optical cavity, again, line up with a perfectly equidistant grid. So if you remember what I, what I mentioned in the beginning, d int is the variation, a deviation from a perfectly equidistant grid spacing. So if d int is equal to zero, we are again on the original, original grid. So here, in fact, I can phase match very easily a forward mixing process. And so what happens is the soliton, okay, uh, when it leaks into this normal GVD window, okay, starts to strongly, okay, transfer energy to this dispersive wave, okay, um, um, whenever, yeah, at, at a point where this d int is equal to zero, and the strength of this dispersive wave critically depends on the height of this barrier. Okay, so if this barrier <coughs> uh, was kind of infinitely high, it would not transfer any energy. Um, and so, um, so you can think about this process of dispersive wave formation really as a fourth mixing process that is kind of resonantly enhanced because the cavity resonances are now, now you know, enhancing the light actually in, 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 um, uh, that, you're, that, you're that you're transferring. And so there's a very simple relation now. If you have just second and third order dispersion, you can immediately show that just the ratio of d2 over d3 times 3 here gives you the position of the dispersive wave. Now, um, um, if you look at the spectrum, uh, another thing I, I want to draw attention to is that um, um, once you know the dispersion of mode families, you can predict with very high accuracy the, the spectrum of the optical comb. And, um, and so the optical comb here, for instance, shown in green, that's a numerical simulation, and in blue here is the, is the, is the actual spectrum. 
what you see in the numerical simulation is that the comb, it's the salt in itself, should experience a recoil. And the reason there's a recoil uh, can be understood by the following. A Fourier mixing process is a process okay, by which you convert always photons to higher and lower energy, okay, to conserve energy. And this conservation of energy, you can also translate into a conservation of, of, uh, of a center of mass. So the center of mass of the spectrum needs to be the same. So if you generate more light on the red spectrum, this has to be compensated by a shift of the remaining power of the spectrum okay, to, to uh, correspondingly higher energies. And so that's why the soliton, when you generate a dispersive wave, must also experience a recoil. Okay, so this recoil is nothing else than energy conservation, okay, uh, or s conservation of center of mass. Now, if you look at the spectrum here, you see actually it's not the case. It somehow seems to, you generate a dispersive wave, but there's no recoil. And the reason there's no recoil is actually there's a Raman effect. And the Raman effect actually causes also the energy of a soliton to lose and actually to compensate that recoil. Now you can have a whole uh, series of effects in these microresonators. Again, you can have with one zero dispersion point, one dispersive wave. If you have two zero dispersion points here and here, d and t equals zero, you can have two dispersive waves. Please also note here, the dispersive wave on the red side here is stronger than on the blue side. You can and this is, so you can immediately see the deeper kind of dips here and valleys come from the high integrated dispersion. Um, and for completeness, I also put two more uh, phenomena here. One is a normal GVD comb. Okay, and in normal G, you generate dark pulses. So these are dark solitons. And these have these characteristic kind of patterns. Um, and I also show uh, a so-called Stokes soliton, where you have a soliton, and then you have a second soliton, and that is generated by the Raman gain. And the frequency difference here is just the SI2 kind of t terahertz phonon in glass. So the soliton propagated in a glass resonator will generate not parametric gain, but Raman gain at a different wavelength. And granted, the free spectral range of this mode family out here is matched with the original one. It, it starts to call what people call a vector soliton. It's two solitons that are coupled. Now, um, <clears throat> you can also have dispersive waves, not generated by um, third order dispersion, but also by avoid mode crossings. So if you have, for instance, two mode families that hybridize, okay, and form very strong kind of local variations in curvature, then you also generate very kind of strong features in the, in the, in the spectrum. And, uh, and these dispersive waves, um, typically go by a name single mode dispersive waves and also here what you have um, a, um, is it also recoil so the very fact you generate more light actually on one side of the comb needs to translate into a recoil to the corresponding uh, opposite side of the spectrum to um, satisfy to satisfy energy conservation um, these uh, these um, recalls also lead to um, a quite intricate interplay um, uh, of uh, of um, the soliton's kind of repetition rate with laser detuning. And uh, this is shown here. So whenever you excite <coughs> a uh, dispersive wave, okay, um, you cause a recoil. And if you have a recoil of the spectrum, that means that your soliton is not centered at the original grid, but slightly, you know, slightly off that grid. And that renormalizes okay, by the D2 coefficient, the rep rate. Okay? And that's simply because of the fact when you translate the soliton center frequency, you also pick up dispersion and you change the, the, the round trip rate. And, um, and what you can see here is <coughs> that um, as you change the detuning, okay, you change the power in the dispersive wave, and that changes here the repetition rate um, uh, in this characteristic manner of this kind of final shaped line. But however, what you also see is that um, this effect here actually has hysteresis. So if you look, if you, if you tune the laser forward and backward, actually these two actually don't line up. And that causes actually some quite some intricate interplay um, and in particular, this effect of single mode dispersive wave has one um, undesirable property, which is that it couples any frequency fluctuations of the laser to repetition rate detunings. And so it makes you very sensitive to, to, to laser pump noise. Um, now, coming back to this original spectrum, what I mentioned here, if, um, so there's a, if you generate a dispersive wave on the, on the long wavelength side, there should be a recoil. And this spectrum here, you see an absence of a recoil. So why is there no recoil here? There's no recall because there's a Raman cell frequency shift. And um, so um, the animation is actually not working in this PDF file here, but, but let me just mention here, if you, if you have a pump laser and you, and you detune the laser, you generate a, a soliton with progressively shorter duration. And what you can see here from red to green, sorry, from blue to, r to green to red, is that the soliton shifts progressively further, okay, in this case, to the red. And why is it shifting? It's shifting because the duration becomes shorter and as the duration becomes shorter, the peak intensity increases, and the peak intensity 
causes a correspondingly larger kind of Raman shift okay, of, the, of the sauton. And um, this uh, Raman self-frequency shift um, um, yeah, can be, can be um, observed as a shift of the sequence hyperbolic kind of center compared to the pump. And it can be quite strong. So here's an example where the Raman self-frequency shift can be as large as kind of 7 terahertz okay, um, from, the, from the actual original kind of um, center frequency. Um, now, how to model this effect? Um, you can include this uh, Raman self-frequency shift in the gluatural favor equation. And the way this is typically done is to include the so-called yeah, um, Raman response function. So this Raman response function is nothing else than a typical sinusoidal oscillation that's damped. It's characterized typically by two decay times, T1 and T2. T1 is the decay time of the, of the exponential envelope. T2 is the underlying uh, period of oscillation. And what one typically does is that for, um, for a pulse whose spectral bandwidth is smaller than uh, the characteristic Raman frequency, you typically do an approximation where you only um, don't retain the entire kernel here, but you obtain only the first derivative. So you can think about the response function, you know, just the, the slope at, 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 uh, at zero frequency. And this is called Raman shock term. Okay. Um, now, also, you have to introduce a called a Raman fraction. So for glass, it's about 20%, but uh, that fraction can be wildly different for different materials. And so you need to kind of experimentally um, uh, generate spectra and then compare to theory kind of what fraction kind of matches your, your observation. So in the case of uh, the original spectra I've shown here, um, so, um, so this can be, again, um, uh, simulation and, uh, and experiment can again be compared. And now, in order to bring the two in agreement, what you have to include is this Raman shock term. Okay, so you have a contrib contribution of Raman, um, and then the only characteristic here is the TR, the, the shock time, FR is the Raman fraction, and then you have just a derivative with respect to the angular coordinate. And, um, and in the case of silicon nitride, the effect actually is about an order of magnitude weaker than in glass. Yes? Uh, what defines the threshold for this Raman um, there's, no really, there's no really threshold here. The only, um, the, what you have for the Raman is, um, you have, the Raman is inten also an intensity dependent process. So it has the same kind of form as the, as the kernel linearity, except that the Raman is a time delayed um, uh, process. And that in frequency domain implies that actually is a frequency dependence that you need to take into account. And that's exactly what is Raman shock term is. Raman shock term, so to speak, is the, is the, is, the, is the first term in omega okay, in the Fourier expansion. And if you write as, in like a, as, a, as a time domain equation, it just becomes the first derivative with respect to the, to, to the angular coordinate. Uh, because uh, there, might, uh, so there, there might be some constant that uh, if you have like some, if you, like, if you, act, if you have Raman laser basically that is initiated before your soliton formation. So yeah, 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 yeah. So that's actually very, actually very interesting point, very important point. So, um, so uh, that's absolutely correct. So the, so these, um, in principle, um, this Raman term itself, okay. Again, if you, you don't have to write like a mean field, but you can just write like covered mode equations. Um, Raman can also give gain, and Raman can cause Raman lasing, and um, uh, the subtle point is that um, this again depends um, which wavelength you pump. So if, um, the Raman cross section. Um, uh, has a uh, dependence on wavelengths, and if I'm not mistaken, it should, uh, there should be, a, I think it's quadratic in wavelengths. Um, uh, sorry, inverse quadratic, so if you go to shorter wave, it becomes stronger. And, um, and so, um, so it becomes subtle. So I'll give you one example. If you have materials like crystals, okay, um, the Raman gain is very narrow. Okay, and there, uh, if you have a resonator that doesn't sample the Raman gain, so the, the resonances are you know, broadly, or the free spectral range is large compared to the Raman gain bandwidth, then um, if you don't sample the Raman gain maximum, you will ha won't have Raman lasing. If you happen to sample with one of the comb teeth your Raman gain peak, you'll get Raman lasing first. And this will inhibit salt information because whenever you have Raman lasing, you'll clamp the intercavity power and you, and, uh, and you have gain clamping. And so one famous example is diamond. Okay, diamond has incredibly strong Raman indivisible. So if you make integrated photonics from diamond, you will always make Raman lasers uh, when you go below a repetition rate of 100 gigahertz. Um, and so many materials will face that challenge, um, uh, not just uh, diamond, because uh, the Raman gain becomes very significant uh, uh, when you go towards the visible. And that threshold, that high 
Yeah, FSR, exactly, FS, exactly, yeah, yeah. So I think there will ultimately be a limit for many of these systems because the Raman, um, when you, yeah, when you go very close to the band gap, you're, you also start to electronically enhance kind of the, the Raman coupling and, uh, and that will then be naturally a limitation of the process. Yeah, it's a very good point, yeah, yeah. So um, the LLE equation that I mentioned, I just for complete, so I placed it here. So in, in principle, if you want to model kind of, uh, um, uh, you know, um, the carrier frequency co uh, combs, then there's really, there's really two modifications that really become important. One is the higher order dispersion effects that are wrapped in this dispersion operator D here. And the second part is the Raman self-frequency shift. And, um, and those are really the dominant ones that you need to include in a simulation. You can also include thermal shifts of the cavity. They will not change the spectrum. They will only change okay, the way you can access the soliton. And they will explain, for instance, why soliton can switch. So um, for completeness, I want, want to also mention that there's not just bright solitons. There's also dark solitons or dark pulses. And so again, if you have the equation I mentioned before, okay, that it was this S parameter and it was minus one for the bright soliton case, it can also be um, basically positive. And then we talk about uh, the nonlinear Schrodinger equation describing dark solitons. And what are these dark solitons? These are actually the first experiments done by, uh, at Bell Labs by Weiner. So these are dips on top of a CW pulse, or a long pulse as shown here. And, um, and uh, so that's why you call them dark pulses. And, um, and these dark pulses also exist in microresonators. Um, they're called switching wave or platicons. And, um, and they are, if this is the angular coordinate, this is the intracavity field, these switching waves are describing um, uh, effectively yeah, um, uh, a, a dark region in the, in the background of the intracavity field. Now one complication with these uh, dark pulses is their excitation. So I described in the case of bright solitons, there's a well-defined soft excitation pathway where you first climb up this MI state, cross the breathers and fall into the soliton state. The problem with these dark states is that you cannot see them because the upper and lower branch are now reversed. So the bright soliton, the soliton is on the, is the, constitutes the upper part, the upper branch. The CW is the lower branch. Okay, for the dark, it's exactly opposite. Okay, so the upper branch is the CW, the lower one, actually that's, the, that's your, that's your dark, dark soliton. The problem is that there's no way that you can see it, okay, the CW background, the lower one. And so what you need to have is in practice avoided mode crossings that give you a little bit of background that you can see the solitons from. And that's actually what happened in this experiment from, from uh, shown here. And uh, you can see the spectrum here and you can see the resemblance. Uh, this part actually is, is not coherent, um, but this part of course constitutes a dark, dark pulse. And you can uh, corroborate this with, um, with drop ports and, and reconstructive phases. Now one thing that's quite interesting about um, these uh, dark pulses is that because upper branch and lower branch are reversed. Okay, in fact, the salt and efficiency is higher. So if you compute the power actually in the dark pulse compared to a bright case, it's actually higher. And, uh, and that's, again, it's very simply sim because the, la the, the laser is now not very far detuned from the cavity, but the CW laser actually is resonant and just the salt and actually is far detuned. So it actually, they, they switch role. And that's actually why you have a higher efficiency. Um, this, uh, there's a lot of salt and dynamics that I won't talk about, but there's um, uh, there are salt on switching, there's uh, the Raman self-frequency shift, there's salt on crystallization, um, and there's, there's many kind of phenomena that you can, that you can study in these systems. Um, and, um, and, and again, many of these phenomena are, are well described by including more perturbations of this uh, Loretta Lefebvre equation. Um, I want to touch on a few applications of combs uh, as well in salt on microcombs. Um, so I'll leave kind of the, uh, the, the, their, their properties here. And uh, what I'd like to <coughs> talk about is um, some examples um, of where you can use microcombs for. And the first example I want to give is dual comb spectroscopy. So dual comb spectroscopy is a technique by, by which you take two optical frequency combs. And um, one of the optical frequency combs serves, serves as a local oscillator for a second um, optical comb that's interrogating a species, say, say GAN. You know, so in this case, uh, molecules. And um, the dual comb technique consists um, in uh, taking two combs that have different repetition rates. And if you then uh, measure the beating on a photodetector, what you obtain is you map the optical spectrum into the RF. 
So each comb teeth okay, has a unique beating frequency that will increase as a function of um, the, the comb teeth you're looking at. And so this implies that you can map any pair of optical frequencies to one pair of a one single RF frequency. And what's shown here is an example of such an, uh, um, a dual comb cytoscopy experiment. These are two micro resonator combs in separate chips. They have a slight repetition rate offset, and you can see here the RF interferogram. And so if this is sequence hyperbolic, then again you obtain a sequence hyperbolic squared on the, uh, on the electrical photocurrent. And um, <coughs> so this RF, this these, uh, dual comb spectroscopy is nothing else than FTIR, whereby you replace the scanning mirror actually with uh, a second frequency combs. And uh, you can also exactly see why, because the scanning mirror okay, will impart a Doppler shift. And the Doppler shift is exactly what is a, a, a frequency shifted optical comb. Okay, so that's the relation between FTIR with a scannable mirror and a, and a, and a, uh, a dual comb spectrometer. Now, how can you generate um, uh, um, uh, dual frequency combs? And one very elegant method to do so is to exploit the intrinsic degeneracy of a Westman gain mode Riker resonator. Because what I mentioned earlier, you have angular momentum eigenstates, EI and phi. Um, but there's not just an E I M phi, there's also an E minus I M phi. So the light can either propagate clockwise or counterclockwise. And these are ideally completely degenerate. And so now what you can do is, and there's uh, two ways to do this experiment, is one is you inject um, from the clockwise and the counterclockwise uh, side two different laser frequencies. So you purposely offset the pump laser frequency. And um, now what you would do is you would scan uh, both lasers in unison through the MI region, the breather region, and the stable soliton region. And once you um, hit the, the single soliton state, okay, you would have two single solitons uh, propagating in a clockwise and counterclockwise direction. But now, um, uh, these two have a different offset frequency okay, um, that you can, in this case, choose with an AOM. And if you remember, if the pump lasers are slightly offset, there's also a change in repetition rate. And, uh, and the reason that is because of the dispersion D2. Another way to actually uh, separate the two frequencies is by choosing a power imbalance. Because if one path has more power than the other, it means you make the Raman, Raman cell frequency shift larger for one soliton than for the other. If you have a Raman cell frequency shift, you, you change the center of the soliton. And that, again, via D2, changes the repetition rate. So that, that's how you can actually um, uh, have these two combs slightly non-degenerate. Now, um, this only works to a certain amount of, of certain degree of certain degree because any backscattering, and this is just like the Zaniak effect in an interferometer, okay, for measuring rotation. When you have a little bit of backscattering, the two clockwise and clockwise directions will lock. And so in this case, uh, there's a few tens of kilohertz of, of bandwidth that you have of which the two soliton streams will lock. If you go beyond 10 kilohertz offset, there'll be, there'll be no locking and you can actually then record an interferogram. Now, um, there's one kind of uh, aspect that is a little, non a little subtle here. So the, this RF interferogram is, um, if you look at it carefully, what you'll notice is that um, it goes all the way to DC, to zero. And this is because <coughs> positive and negative Fourier frequencies we cannot differentiate, right? And uh, there is a pair of beat nodes on this side and on this side that fall exactly on positive and negative side. Um, now, you could still retain that information. And the way you can retrieve it is by doing so-called IQ detection. So if you measure two quadratures, then you can actually still take the spectrum and get separately from this the both positive and negative frequency part. Um, this is using clockwise and counterclockwise. But what about taking, the, if, you would, if you're interested in removing that frequency comb to very high offset frequency? So, so what could, how could you do this? Now, for this, you would have to make the frequency difference of the two rep rates larger, and ideally also offset the two pump frequencies by a larger amount. And in this scheme here, you're of course limited just to the cavity decay rate, right? So you cannot detune further than that in order to still stably generate two solitons in the same mode family. So an alternative method to generate um, multiple frequency comb with the same resonator is to exploit the fact that any cavity has also multiple transverse modes. Okay, so this is an example here of a crystal resonator that's polished, but it can also be a, a waveguide with multiple modes. And, um, and in general, um, higher order modes will have a different kind of center of gravity, okay, of the optical mode. So they'll generally, if you go to higher order modes that are deeper, okay, to the interior of the cavity, they'll have a shorter round trip time, so a larger free speckle range. So one, um, so by pumping different kind of spatial mode orders, you can directly, you can generate solitons with different repetition rates in the same resonator. 
And here's an example um, uh, how this can be done. So the way you do this in the case uh, of a crystal resonator is um, in order to get very uh, highly coherent combs, what you do is you uh, don't pump with two separate lasers, but rather what you do is you use a so-called single siphon modulator. And the single siphon modulator, in this case, is driven by two RF frequencies to generate two sidebands, okay, that are, in this case, um, that you can tune with, an, with a synthesizer. And um, these sidebands in this uh, example here, they are separated um, by uh, just the, the, the splitting between the, the two mode families in question. Um, so it can be a few gigahertz or as small as a few hundred of kilohertz. So if you pump with this bichromatic pump now, simultaneously again, two mode families, what you need to do to generate solitons is you need to overlap the soliton generation windows. Okay, so you need to make sure not only that these two, rest, the two laser fields interact with the cavity modes, but also that the solitons are generated at the same time. Okay, so you need to also make sure that the temporal sequence by which you scan is, is, is properly chosen. And if you do that, you can generate two dissipative care solitons um, and inside the same resonator and obtain the dual comb interferogram. So this is the interferogram in time domain. You see the spikes as the combs kind of walk through each other. Th sorry, the pulses walk through each other. Um, um, the spacing in this case uh, is about 1.5 microsecond. Um, that's the inverse of the repetition rate. And this is the interferogram. If you fully transform it, then you obtain the RF comb spectrum. So here in this case, it's centered at four gigahertz. So four gigahertz was the offset. So it's now significantly larger than in the clockwise tunnel clockwise scheme with the same modes. <coughs> and the uh, um, difference here was about 600 kilohertz. And, uh, and also, um, by using the same resonator, you also have very good mutual coherence. So in this case, we have a resolution bandwidth of about 100 hertz. And um, that's still resolution bandwidth limited. Now the advantage here in this scheme is that you don't have this uh, um, folding. So remember, if you um, uh, have a situation where the comb teeth are somewhat degenerate, then you have the DC as part of your RF interferogram. In this case, the interferogram is offset, actually, from DC. right? So in this case, it's 4 gigahertz. So you have, you know, you have mapped it in a non-ambiguous way. You don't need IQ detection to uh, recover the, uh, the, um, the, two, um, the, the full spectrum. And this you can use for spectroscopy. Huh? So you can, for instance, take one of the combs, run it through an amplitude uh, um, uh, filter, uh, run it through a, a wave shaper that also changes the phase. So what, uh, the, the red here is what we programmed on the wave shaper um, in amplitude and phase. And then you can take the interferogram and uh, compute not just the amplitude of the interferogram, but also retrieve the phases. So look at the um, real of the imaginary part, get the arc tank. And then you get the phase profile here, and you can get, yeah, you see that follows as well the, the, the original uh, program, program sequence. So um, another interesting question is if you have solitons propagating in the same resonator, okay, what about intermodulation products? Because after all, these are solitons, they see each other, right? So you would naturally wonder, okay, what about, um, is there maybe spurious peaks that you generate? Now here's something quite interesting. Um, so, and it becomes, um, y or you can answer that question already by thinking a little bit about the problem. So let's first consider the case where um, red and blue are generating the same mode family. So where they're clockwise and counterclockwise. So in that case, in fact, you will not have intermodulation products. And the reason you can't have intermodulation products is that the four wave mixing can never be phase matched. So if you take a photon with angular momentum m, you take a photon with an angular momentum minus m, and you scatter to m plus 1, minus m plus 1, uh, minus m minus 1, you always have plus 2 difference in angular momentum. So the clockwise counterclockwise scheme, okay, for the same mode family will never lead to intermodulation products. Now it is not the case if they travel in the same direction, okay? So in this scenario here, okay, what you would expect is that there is, in fact, an intermodulation product happening. And that's the case. So if you look at, uh, um, uh, at, the, at the case where the two solitons, okay, if, the if the repetition rate difference is quite small compared to the cavity decay rate, what you can see is that around a heterodyne beat node, you see actually side peaks appearing. Okay? And these side peaks are the two solitons that are traveling in the same direction Periodically seeing each other. Now this effect is filtered by the cavity. Okay, so if you make sure that the two salt and streams travel, okay, um, um, around each other sufficiently fast, 
compared to the rate of the cavity decay, then actually this effect will be strongly filtered. This effect will be strongly filtered. And you can think about these, uh, side, these side bands here that you generate, again, as Fourier mixing. So you can think about having one comb in blue, one comb in red, and you can, again, think about Fourier mixing pathways that generate side bands. And how does this intermodulation product appear? Well, what you do is the following. Okay, you take, again, you have red as one mode family, blue is the other mode family. Okay, if you take two photons of one photon each of one photon family, what you can do is you can scatter now symmetrically. But in fact, what you see is you don't line up on the red. You actually need a photon that's slightly offset. And that little slightly offset exactly is what these side bands are. So these side bands are generated in the Fourier mixing product that's off resonant and that generates kind of these uh, the, the side bands on the, uh, on the carrier. So you do have intermodulation side bands whenever you have solitons propagating the same direction. Now you do the same experiments the other way around, clockwise, counterclockwise. Okay, these are forbidden. Okay, because you can then not satisfy any more angular momentum conservation. And uh, so intermodulation products only appear when you, when you uh, are uh, injecting solitons in the same sense of circulation. In the colliding scheme, there cannot be intermodulation products. Um, this you can see here. This is a triple comb scheme. So again, you take now three side bands. You pump three different mode families. You generate three solitons at the same time. And in this scheme, there were two solitons clockwise, one soliton counterclockwise. And so here's what you see. This is comb one and two, okay? One and two are traveling, okay, counterclockwise. If you look at the spectrum, you have to look very cautiously, but you don't see any more array pattern. Now, look at two and three, okay? Again, these are traveling counterclockwise to each other. Again, you will see no intermodulation products. Now, look at one and three. One and three actually are co-propagating. That's the case, actually, of blue and red here, okay? In this case, if you look, you see this moiré pattern. That moiré pattern are intermodulation side bands that are generated, okay, far outside the cavity bandwidth, but each comb line is modulated with the uh, difference in the repetition rate of the two solitons. Yeah? So this exactly shows that in the same direction, intermodulation side bands, if they're counterclockwise, counterpropagating, you don't see them. And again, the reason being is angular momentum conservation is not satisfied, angular momentum conservation is satisfied. Now, um, let me spend um, a few minutes on, on applications um, of, uh, of care frequency combs. And, um, and um, so care frequency combs um, have applications where, or, or can in particular be used in applications where having a high repetition rate is useful. And uh, because of their small size, obviously the pulse repetition rate can be you know, tens to even hundreds of gigahertz, even terahertz. And there's a few applications where this is naturally the case. Um, one example is astrophysical spectrometer calibration. Um, astrophysical spectrometers have a low resolution power. And so typically adjacent pixels can only differentiate, can only be differentiated when the wavelength um, changes by at least 10 gigahertz or more. So um, if you'd like to use an optical comb for calibration, the rep rate needs to be at least 10 gig. And that's the case for micro resonator combs, much less so for, for femtosecond lasers. Um, if you're interested to use combs for coherent communications, then um, the natural kind of scale that you have to abide to is the telecom spacing, so the ITU grid, so 25, 50, 100 gigahertz. Um, and so here, again, uh, care combs very nicely match up to. Um, you can also use the wide mode spacing and broad bandwidth for fast distance measurements. Um, and, that's, um, uh, and also for uh, photonic radar, where you like to digitize a, a, a signal and you like to do this digitization at the uh, carrier frequency, which for radar is typically kind of the x bands or 10 gigahertz. So a um, few examples. Um, so these care combs have already been employed in kind of system level type of demonstrations. Um, this is an artist rendition, um, but um, this is an actual spectrum that we use for coherent communication. And uh, here, um, um, one point denotes uh, um, uh, attention. That is, typically, if you use a bright soliton, as I mentioned, the conversion efficiency is, is quite low. It's typically the ratio of the pulse duration um, divided by the round trip time. And so if you have a very short soliton, let's say only say 25 femtosecond, and your round trip time is, say, 10 picosecond, you have efficiencies on the order of a percent. So if you have a watt of power, only 10 milliwatt is converted into, into a usable comb bandwidth. Um, and so for optical telecommunication, for instance, what um, is key is the so-called optical signal-to-noise ratio. And that is nothing else than the, 
signal to noise in a resolution bandwidth of 100 gigahertz in 0.1 nanometer. And, uh, and, and, and for instance, these experiments, okay, you typically need to have about, you know, um, a, a OSNR of about 30 to 40 dB um, for doing coherent communication. And that can be achieved if you pump strongly, if you pump with about a watt of power in the, in, in the pump. Then you can convert um, to power levels that give you sufficient OSNR to do kind of also advanced um, uh, modulation schemes where you encode, for instance, in this 16 QAM uh, uh, protocols. Now, what's the fastest that has been done? I mean, not just for the experts, but we can, you can do actually with, with these characoms about 50 terabit per second. Now, if you ask what's the record in telecom, well, that's petabit per second. It's very far away. But this is kind of the largest that's been done actually with a, with a, with a, with a care frequency comb, or generally with a comb to date. Um, um, you can also exploit um, the uh, large repetition rate for doing very fast distance measurements. And uh, this is an example where uh, two combs are used um, with 100 gigahertz repetition rate. Um, they're offset here by, um, yeah, by 0.1 gigahertz, so 100 megahertz. You send one comb out to a, an object, okay, let it reflect, go through a circulator, combine in a balanced flow detector, superimpose it with a comb. All, another portion of the comb is directly fed into a second balance detector. Again, you have an IQ detector here. Um, you record both on an ultra-fast scope here, so a 32 gigahertz. And in this case, your dual comb interferogram is centered here at 18 gigahertz. So it's an extremely fast frequency. Yeah? And, um, and um, what you can do now is you can um, do a so-called unwrapping of the face protocol. So if you have a certain object here, right, that's a distance L away, then um, uh, you know how the optical path evolves. That's just 2 times K times L and the K varies as a function of your, your comb teeth. So if you unwrap the face, yeah, then you can find the distance to the object. Now, how fast can you, um, can you measure? Well, that's limited in, uh, uh, effectively simply by um, your ability to sample the interfer entire interferogram. So you're limited by, um, in this case, by Nyquist. And, um, and that's, in this case, translates simply in the distance of pulses. So your, um, your, short, your fastest acquisition time here is limited by the round trip time, which in this case is about 10, 10 picosecond. And so um, in this experiment, um, to demonstrate this very fast kind of time, time resolution, kind of a pellet was shot uh, with about 0.4 Mach. Um, and, um, uh, and it was possible to actually accurately measure the shape of the pellet. And, uh, and what's shown in blue is the static measurement with an OCT. And this was measured in flight. And uh, again, the, the, the so you have two parameters here, the comb repetition rate and the comb bandwidth. The comb bandwidth sets a precision by which you can measure. The comb repetition rate tells you the, the, the speed at which you can measure. You know, and the resolution is given by the bandwidth. And here, in these experiments, the resolution was 12 nanometer here in, 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 in 14 microseconds of, of averaging time. Um, so that's an example, a very extreme example. I mean, there's not many examples where you need something, uh, where you measure something fast, but it shows that um, what this bandwidth can be useful for into repetition rate spacing. Um, you can also drive sartons, not just with CW lasers, but also in a slightly more complicated fashion. Um, you can replace uh, your seed laser by in, an injection lock laser. So here, this is actually a gain chip with a high reflective, um, high reflective mirror on the back side, low reflectivity mirror on the front side. And so this is a multi-mode laser diode. And if you um, have a little bit of backscattering inside the resonator, what happens is that the laser will injection lock actually to the optical cavity. And at the same time, okay, it, it will cause the promotion or the generation of a temporal soliton. So it's a quite complicated system to model because you have uh, uh, the NLE describing the resonator, you have some back reflection, and then you have the gain medium. But the composite system will also allow the generation of this bit of care solitons. And, and that's shown here. So here you see the injection lock laser and also the soliton um, uh, from this uh, multi-mode DFB diode. And so the diode itself here is aligned with about 10 gigahertz. The moment is injection lock that collapses down to 100 kilohertz. Um, another um, application, um, uh, as alluded to earlier, is uh, astrophysical spectrometer calibration. That's perhaps one of the applications where, um, again, rep rate is, is quite, quite important. So um, this is a recent work um, that came out from CSCM where um, the resonator was not CW driven, but pulse driven. And why would you want to drive a resonator pulsed 
Well, this is to increase the salt and conversion efficiency. And in this case, if the overlap between the pulse that drives the salt on and the salt itself is increased, the salt and efficiency increases. And this allows also to generate spectra that can be uh, very broad, can comprise as much as 2,000 lines uh, in the 3B bandwidth uh, and extend over several hundreds of nanometers. And this was recently used in, in an astrophysical spectrometer calibration. This is the thorium organ lamp that you typically use uh, for, for calibrating astrophysical spectrometers. A thorium is used because there's a much higher melting temperature, so you can, you can have the filament burn much hotter. Um, and uh, the bottom line here is the regular comb, and you can see the advantage because there's much less variations of the lines compared to the thorium organ case. Um, uh, so you have much better control and much better accuracy of your, of your calibration. Um, there has been a last year also um, lots of effort into using these chip scale combs to generate um, atomic clocks and frequency synthesizers. This is just two examples I give here. Um, uh, of uh, two recent works of, uh, um, of, uh, of so-called ACES program and Darfur Dodos program. And um, uh, what I suppose to get from this chart is simply that by nesting two combs, one with a terahertz mode spacing for generating an octave and one for a 15 gigahertz to heterodyne the one terahertz spacing, you can in principle generate kind of a nested comb that um, um, kind of can, can bridge the octave with a minimum number of comb teeth um, and these are kind of, yeah, all in principle devices you can generate with integrated photonics. Now, such a artwork here um, is, is still, of course, an artist's rendition, but um, uh, one can get all elements function in a way that allow to uh, generate an RF to optical link and, and thereby f hopefully in the future generate um, uh, very compact optical atomic clocks like, like the one shown here. Um, now, the last. Um, you know, last part is admittedly now falls a little short. I still want to switch gears and also mention that a lot of the advances in integrated photonics you can also use um, for superconduction generation. And in fact, superconduction generation bears many similarities to CARICOM generation. Um, the underlying equations are very similar. They are also nonlinear Schrodinger equations now formulated in, in spatial domain. And um, and. So in principle, um, the CARICOM generation that is um, occurring here with CW, you can also compare to superconduction generation in, 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 in ring waveguides, or sorry, in, in, in meandered waveguides. And so first, um, a few comments about superconduction generation. So superconduction generation, as described, was um, uh, absolutely essential to realize the first self-reference frequency combs in photonic crystal fibers in the late 90s. And since then has been studied extensively in, in many different, uh, um, in particular photonic crystal fibers, but also in, in, in waveguides. And so in generally the, general, there's of course a large number of materials that you can choose for, for supercontinuum. And as I described, uh, what you typically like to um, look for is materials that avoid two photon absorption um, and also have a higher effective index because a higher effective index translates into very small kind of cross-section or effective cross-section of the, of the optical mode. And, uh, and so if you look at these materials, like one material for instance, that stands out for telecom applications is gallium phosphide, because gallium phosphide has a band gap of about 2 eV and a high uh, effective index um, of, uh, of close to 3. Um, and that gives you actually uh, effective nonlinearity that's 10 times higher than silicon nitride. Now, um, if you... Um, Look at this kind of list of materials. Other materials, for instance, that are yeah, shown here are the cacogenides, lithium iodate. It also has electro-optic coefficients, um, diamond, algas, uh, hydex. Um, and again, you would have to um, look at the wavelength range you're interested in. If you, if you are, for instance, int interested in generating light in the visible, obviously a platform like germanium or algas would not be ideal because of the uh, simply the, the, the finite band gap. Now, um, you, of course, you have to define dispersion, um, and here I'll be very brief. Um, uh, just, just more as a recap, um, uh, you know, this is to remind ourselves that we have a one, at 1.3 micron, SMF28 has a zero dispersion. We have uh, anomalous dispersion above, a normal dispersion below. We can have dispersion shifted fiber or dispersion flattened fiber, <coughs> and dispersion is typically characterized by the, you know, the GDD coefficient in, in femtosecond squared or dispersion parameter. Uh, expressed as picosecond per nanometer per kilometer. So if I have a yeah, one nanometer band with pulse, uh, it 
has a D of, say, 25, it means there's 25 picosecond over one kilometer of, of dispersion it picks up. So um, two key effects. Um, uh, and uh, first, if you launch uh, a strong pump wave into an optical fiber, you get MI. And um, this MI is exactly what I mentioned at the beginning. This is nothing else than parametric frequency conversion optical fiber. Okay. That um, can be described by exactly the coupled mode equation I showed earlier, um, by the one from Stolen. And uh, you can either model them in frequency domain or in time domain. And in frequency domain, you would have signal idler. In the case of an optical fiber, um, these are continuum of frequencies. And you get what's called parametric gain lobes. Yeah? And again, um, the reason that these gain lobes are not, not maximum near the pump, but rather offset, is exactly this difference in cross and surface modulation that makes you need to acquire a certain you know, momentum mismatch in order to phase match by the difference in SPM and XPM. And if you were to pump stronger, then these side lobes actually would appear even, even further. Now actually, one thing is interesting, if you look even closer, you see these secondary peaks here. So these secondary peaks can now be, again be a, a combination of effects, but in particular it can be just simply the 4 if mixing that's appearing um, as a function. So what you have is the mixing of the pump with the sideband that generates you auxiliary, these, these secondary sidebands. So um, if you want to describe modulation stability in fiber, um, one way is to do it in, in frequency domain, and one way um, is to do it with a mean field equation. And so what you can do is, instead of showing, uh, describing it as a signal idler for if mixing, coupled mode, you can also just write a nonlinear Schrodinger equation uh, without fiber losses. And this equation is very simple. It's just the uh, yeah, first derivative of, of A is uh, given here by beta 2, our NMLS GVD. Then we have the R operator that is just describing the fraction, right? So it describes how the pulse uh, increases in time with propagation distance, and we have here our focus on linearity in case gamma is positive, and that's a kernel linearity. And this equation, again, uh, has a well-defined solution. So its solution is, uh, is just, uh, the, uh, it's just the original uh, pump field, and then it's, uh, there's a self wise modulation, and the self wise modulation just goes like uh, gamma p times that. So the effective linearity times p times distance gives you a nonlinear phase shift. And, um, and um, now you can, um, again, derive your MI gain lobes. I've just put it here for completeness. So what you would do is you would just assume now this solution becomes unstable. So this unsta unstable implies that you generate sidebands. So what you would do is you would just add to your uh, uh, um, self wise modulation of the pump, little sideband A, and you assume there's a positive sideband, a negative sideband, so at plus and minus omega. You plug it into the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, do small signal analysis, and there you go. There you get the parametric sidebands again, and the parametric gain lobes. And so again, you see this typical square root behavior. So the stronger you pump, the, the further the, the gain lobes move apart. This is exactly what I showed you earlier in the graph already. So these are the gain lobes as a function of, of pump power. So um, now, um, let's put everything together. So. Um, in a fiber, you have the slowly varying envelope along the spatial coordinate. You have the parametric gain coefficient, gamma A cubed here. You have fiber losses that you need to include. So you need to include dissipation. And you also have dispersion. And um, you can also, not in addition to the second order dispersion that we needed for the, for the MI gain, we also can add third order dispersion. Okay, that would just be a uh, third derivative of, of tau in this, uh, in this uh, slowly varying envelope approximation. Um, and what we can also include is another term here that comes from the Raman. And this term is introduced in the very same way as it was done for the microresonator case. So it's a so-called Raman shock term. It's only the, the slope of the frequency response, which in time domain translates to the first derivative. And, um, and so these are the th or this equation is, um, it can, can model supercontinuum and, and can capture most of the effects that, um, that, that, uh, that are known. So the effects are, okay, um, um, salt and formation with beta 2, dispersive wave formation with beta 3 in higher order terms. Then it describes uh, also the observation uh, of the Raman cell frequency shift with the last term. And then you have this term here that's called the so-called Raman shock term, sorry, that's called the shock term. And, um, and this shock term is particularly important for very, very short pulses. Okay? And uh, the shock term um, also uh, plays a role whenever your gamma, okay, your effective nonlinearity, becomes frequency dependent. 
And that's something that's not so evident from this equation, but if you think about it for a moment, this gamma, okay, is omega times N2 over C times, times A effective. But if you have a very, very short optical pulse, right, then your optical pulse can principally be octave spanning. And obviously, the effective cross-section between omega and two omega, they will be different. So this term has a problem. If you write just the equation like this, okay, you neglect the fact that in reality, the effective nonlinearity is frequency dependent. And um, so there's two ways around this. Either you, um, uh, you, you formulate this uh, nonlinear Schrodinger equation in frequency domain. There's also a formulation of that. And then you can directly put in actually your gamma, also frequency dependent. Or the other possibility is you actually include by hand, okay, and this is um, uh, how it's done here, this so-called uh, shock term. You include kind of the frequency, the frequency dependent or the, you know, the, the first order, okay, correction of, of gamma via the second term here. But um, uh, generally, you need to be aware that, that uh, if you, whenever you simulate the, the nonlinear Schrodinger equation without the shock term, okay, then you make an approximation that gamma is effectively frequency independent. Um, okay, so these are all the effects that are in, inside here. So we have linear absorption, second order dispersion, third order dispersion, the carry effect, okay, self steepening, okay, the frequency dependence of gamma. And interpulse, and interpulse Raman scattering, or the, Ra the Raman shock term, last term. And so the question is, how do these, how do these um, terms behave? And the best way to learn how these terms behave is um, to make use of um, the code that's already numerically available. So on GitHub, you can download the code from John Dudley and, uh, and uh, so-called split step method. So uh, we'll go into this, but typically it's, um, it's, it's better to separate the computation of uh, dispersion and nonlinearity. And you typically do the t uh, dispersion in, in time and the nonlinearity in frequency domain. So you have kind of two operators here for dispersion and nonlinearity. And uh, we can lo look for first um, at the situation where there is only beta 2. There is uh, no Raman. There is no high order dispersion. And there's also no shock term. And now let's look what happens if you just launch a laser pulse inside, or you let it propagate in the in the Schrodinger equation, and you uh, use for p exactly the case of n equal to one. In that case, you get a sequence double the spectral envelope that just propagates, shape preserving. So it is just a normal case, okay? And there's also no loss in this example here. So we've recovered what we just know from before that a sequence hyperbolic is a solution of the conservative Schrodinger equation, nonlinear Schrodinger equation. So now it becomes more interesting. Let's look at the case n equal to two. So that's the n equal 2 case. And in n equal 2 case, what you see is that the soliton actually, uh, in this case, um, so here n, we put n equal to 2. I'm not sure why it's not showing properly here. And now you see actually the soliton is periodically oscillating in time. OK, so it becomes temporally very compressed in a periodic fashion. And this is a so-called second order, second order soliton. OK, we can also go to a higher order number. OK, this is n equal to 4. OK, and what we see is, again, the same behavior. OK, so we can again solve the nonlinear Schrodinger equation here numerically. There's only beta 2, no beta 3, no Raman shock term. And we're going to get a periodic evolution of the, of the pulse. The pulse compresses, so periodically expands, compresses, expands. OK, and, uh, and, and if you look and compare the n equal 2 to the n equal 3 case, what you will see is that the spectral envelopes become much more complex. And also the pulse actually is much broader. Okay, if you look, there's a significant spectral broadening, actually, in the, in the case of the n equal to 4 compared to the case of the n equal to the 2, obviously because also we have now more pulse energy uh, in, in this case available. Everything is perfectly periodic. Now, where does supercontinuum con uh, generation come into play? It comes into play in the following. We have in this evolution of the pulses, you can see that the spectrum becomes broader, and that implies that temporally the pulse is focused. And this you call compression point. And the very first compression point is the, f is the point where the, the pulse that propagates starts to reach its minimum for the first time. That you call the first, first compression point. And that first compression point, whenever that occurs, um, the soliton will be very sensitive to higher order dispersion, simply on grounds of the fact that it spectrally becomes a very broad band. And in addition, it will become, due to high t peak intensity, very sensitive to Raman as well. And this actually causes the soliton and its first compression point to break down. So 
what this means is that the effect that I showed you before of this periodic compression, you will never see in practice. What you typically will see is at, you will see the first compression point, and then you will see typically the salt on breakup, so you will see salt on fission, and the generation of dispersive waves. So here, for instance, you, what I've plotted is I've taken first order, second order dispersion, third order dispersion. I turned the Raman off. I turned also a shock term off and just again looked what happened. So what you see now is here you see the first compression point, spectral broadening, but now what you see is here the phase matching of the dispersive wave. And uh, you're starting to shed energy and the salt on, the, 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 the salt on itself has lost energy and you start to see then that um, the dispersive wave continues as a trailing edge or leading edge on the salt on itself. Now if you add now um, uh, beta 3 um, plus beta 2, and they go to n equal to 3, okay, you see again the, uh, the formation of a dispersive wave. You also see for n equal to 3 case that you have salt on, uh, um, salt on fission here. So the higher order salt on breaks up into, into, into fundamental salt ons. And um, uh, if you now also turn on the Raman, what you see is that as the pulse, as the salt on fission occurs at the first compression point, you start to see actually a continuous redshift. And this continuous redshift is because the salt on is continuously losing energy, okay, to, to the... To the Ah, that's a good question. Yeah. So, so the so I, I looked a lot, and I saw the 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 the, uh, the answer I would give is um, I I uh, try to read a lot of papers if there's any criteria, and the truth is there's no there's only a very hand waving criteria in, in the community, and that is the following: that um, if your soliton number is larger than ten, you 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 will definitely not have coherent spectra. Yeah. Uh, and, and so in, in order to check if you still have a coherent spectrum, so I can show you one example where it's not coherent. This, this spectrum here would be coherent, and you can also guess kind of why, because the, the, the constituents, they never really interfere, right? So the, 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 the salt and fission here, the, the salt just r runs, runs mm -hmm. off, and it will always be coherent to the, to the original pulse strain. However, if you have a spectrum, okay, like this one here, okay, this example is a very exaggerated example of 30 salatons. And what you, what you should see here is the following, that in this part of the spectrum here, you will still have pretty good coherence. But for the center part, where the different soliton pathways interfere, you, have, you will lose coherence. And you can, kind of, um, you can kind of interpret it if you, okay, in a, in a way, if I now close the gap to the micro and the combs, that this is causing subcomb sub -comb formation. You have multiple frequency combs but their CO is not the same anymore and they will interfere. Okay, except now that we've replaced our periodic kind of, uh, um, um, our part, we, have, we have kind of unwrapped our resonator and, and plotted it as a, as a functional propagation distance. So uh, the way you would numerically propagate it is you would put noise in, have a quantum of noise per, per mode, you would, you would generate a supercontinuum, you would average, and what you would find is actually that the coherence is really dependent on the wavelength. And, um, but in a case like this one here, where your uh, soliton still has very few constituents, and uh, um, um, you would actually uh, you would have a, co a, co a coherent spectrum. Now, how um, how would you generally should you design your supercontinuum generation? What you should generally do is you should optimize for the f you know um, you should stop your supercontinuum process directly after the first compression point. So it, there's no point in propagating the spectrum further. You should just cut it here, and then you get a maximum bandwidth and thereby you uh, obtain, obtain the largest coherence. Um, then this is an example of the self-steepening effect. So this is uh, only this, the, 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 the self-steepening term on, Raman off, and also, and again, you see here now the characteristic structure of self-steepening that is uh, occurring when, when you launch a pulse. Okay, um, now the last aspect I'm gonna show is um, that um, um, when you have integrated photonics, what you can also do is you can, can make use of the fact that you have uh, um, dispersion landscapes that you can engineer. And this is an example of uh, a silicon nitride waveguide. This is from literature, from recent literature. And this is an example where you pump at 15, 15 nanometer. You hit here the first salt and compression point. You have salt and fission. And you have dispersive wave formation on both the short wavelength side and long wavelength side. In this case, actually, the dispersive wave can be pushed all the way to about 4 micron, so quite far into mid IR. And this dispersive wave actually is fully coherent with the original uh, pulse stream, even though it's spectrally uh, quite, quite separated. This is the spectrum, and this is the optical pulse. Okay, so you can see here these this, uh, two pulses. Um, this is due to the fact that the GBD is different. 
and uh, and this spectrum here corresponds to um, um, yeah to a silicon nitride waveguide pumped at 1550 nanometer with about one nanojoule and generates a coherent dispersive wave in the mid IR. How can you verify a coherence? What you do again, you, you look at the second order, uh, first, sorry, uh, uh, the first order autocorrelation function. So you generate multiple simulation sets with the different noise, you see that. And in this case, you actually find that um, this spectrum is fully coherent in, in the mid IR. And this is again expected um, if you look uh, in, the, in the time domain because you still uh, have pulses that are, that are still co propagating. And uh, as one of the applications of this is you can do dual comb spectroscopy. Um, so this is an example where you generate with a nanojoule of energy emitted infrared spectrum. You um, take two of these devices, okay, and, uh, and now you can also play some tricks. Um, one of the tricks is, for instance, you can take coupled waveguides to flatten the dispersion emit IR. Um, so to make use of this bonding antibonding, and, uh, and you can actually generate um, Chromes in the mid infrared spectral range um, that allow you to do dual comb spectroscopy. And uh, there will be actually also one presentation here, Cleo given, uh, on, on DCS using the silicon nitride. Now, um, this is only one example, um, um, but you could also imagine that uh, you could make much more complex kind of waveguide structures, like not just two double core, but triple core, even, even more complicated structures. And it shows that um, in contrast to fibers, what is the advantage of integrated photonics? is that you can not only determine or engineer the cross-section, but also you can engineer the longitudinal pulse propagation. So you can shape kind of the, you can have first a compression region, then you can have an NMLS GVD region for doing supercontinuum, and then a waveguide for output coupling. And you can do all that um, with lithographic control in both the actual dimension and also the cross-section. Um, so with this, um, I want to point to two kind of, uh, kind of reviews. Um, in particular, there's a very, very nice review on supercontinuum generation uh, and its relation to assault information that's been written by John Dudley and uh, Genty and Korn. And um, there's a recent review by Alex Geda, Mira Lipson, and myself, where we take a viewpoint of supercontinuum generation and also microresonator frequency combs and uh, kind of treat them both on the, uh, uh, compare the LLE and the NLS uh, and, um, uh, and rediscover the same physics of dispersed wave formation, Raman cell frequency shift, really, in, in, in both domains. And if you have any questions, I'm, I'm still around in here, and uh, yeah, thank you for your time and interest. <laughs>